know you wish things were different. I wish things were different. But they ain't. This video will be broken up into the following sections. The prologue of the game, which takes place in Jackson, Ellie's playable segment, Abby's playable segment, both of which take place in Seattle, the epilogue, which takes place mainly in Santa Barbara, and the final section containing my thoughts about the ending and the resolution of Ellie's arc. Before we begin, let me give two disclaimers. While overall I think the gameplay has been improved from the first game, I will only focus on mechanics I believe are intrinsic to the storytelling. And though the title may have tipped you off, for warning, this is going to be an exceedingly negative review of the game's story. The game is a visual marvel, the voice actors brought their absolute A-game, and there are many moments that I felt were individually excellent and even surpassed anything in the first game. But while I find the first game to be a prime example of a piece of media that is far greater than the sum of its parts, Part 2 is perhaps the quintessential example of a piece of media that is tremendously worse than the sum of its parts. When analyzed as a whole, it is a confounding piece of storytelling, with the intentions of the writers and the themes of the story being muddled by the audacious, but ultimately half-baked, narrative and structural choices. With all of that said, let's begin. The story begins with a short scene between the brothers Miller, Joel and Tommy, in which Joel informs Tommy of the events that took place in Salt Lake City at the conclusion of the first game, where Joel slarred his way through the fireflies in order to save Ellie's life, but at the cost of what could have possibly been a vaccine for the cordyceps infection. We are then treated to a short credit sequence where we play as Joel as he and Tommy make their way back to the Jackson settlement. In retrospect, this may have been intended as a clever piece of foreshadowing considering the fate of our first playable character and the game's predecessor. We are then treated to a lovely scene of Joel playing guitar for Ellie, showing that despite the fact that Ellie, at least to some extent, knows that Joel isn't being completely honest with her about what happened in Salt Lake City, due to their love for one another, their relationship is holding steady, at least for the time being. Cut to several years later to find Ellie is a young woman living in Jackson. The first thing that is apparent is Ellie's disposition, her seeming to be far more somber than the hopeful Ellie we remember from the first game, a personality shift that was hinted at in the final segment of part one, and one that makes sense given both the trauma she endured during the journey to find the fireflies, and the fact that said journey ended up being fruitless, thus rendering the deaths of those lost along the way ultimately meaningless. It is also apparent that her and Joel are currently on the outs, though the exact reason why is not made clear. We then establish Ellie's current life in Jackson, particularly her blooming romance with a woman named Dina, and the semi-love triangle it results in due to Dina's past relationship with a young man named Jesse. Despite the apocalyptic world she exists in, it seems that Ellie has reached a point in her life where she is able to enjoy some sense of normalcy, and finally has an opportunity to be a regular teenager, completely oblivious that her seemingly content lifestyle is about to be destroyed. During the prologue segment, the player is also given control of a brand new character. Not identified by name just yet, but whom we later come to know as Abby. Abby is a member of the Washington Liberation Front, and her and a group of other WLF members are camped out just outside of Jackson, pursuing someone in the Jackson settlement, although we are not told who. We also meet a man named Owen, and sense some romantic tension between him and Abby, demonstrated by her reaction after he mentions he got another woman, Mel, pregnant. While trying to make her way into the Jackson settlement alone, Abby is attacked by a horde of infected, but is saved by none other than Joel and Tommy. The three are able to make their way to momentary safety, but the horde is still upon them. Abby tells Joel and Tommy of her group and leads them to their hideout. Upon arriving, the brothers are restrained, and we learn that Abby and her group have come to Jackson in order to hunt down Joel for a reason that has yet to be made clear. Upon learning from Jesse that Joel and Tommy never returned from their patrol, Ellie sets off to look for them. She stumbles upon Abby's group's hideout and walks in on Joel being tortured to death by Abby. Ellie is restrained and can only helplessly look on as Abby kills Joel with a final blow to the head. The WLF group then leaves Ellie and Tommy, who are later found by Dina and the others. Ellie immediately wants to seek vengeance for Joel's death, but Tommy tries to convince her against it, saying they are not able to spare troops without leaving Jackson vulnerable. But Ellie is dead set on hunting Joel's killers down, 
The next morning, we learn that Tommy has set off on his own to Seattle to hunt down those who killed Joel. Maria, Tommy's wife and the leader of the settlement, informs Ellie and Dina of Tommy's departure and gives Ellie and Dina her blessing to travel to Seattle, having them promise her that they will bring Tommy home alive. So let's backtrack and discuss. The intro with Joel and Tommy, the short scene between Joel and Ellie, the establishing of the Jackson community, and the development of Ellie's relationship with Dina all work well. My only criticism would be that the pacing of the switching between Ellie and Abby in the prologue is a little wonky. With us going from Ellie for about 15 minutes to Abby for about the same amount of time, but then switching back to Ellie for around an hour, only to switch back to Abby for about 10 to 15 or so minutes, and then back to Ellie. The extended length of the sequence where we switch back to Ellie the first time does throw the pacing off. I most likely would have only cut to Abby after Dina and Ellie get it on, and then switch back to Ellie after Joel and Tommy are ambushed. But it isn't all that detrimental in and of itself, and is necessary in order to establish Ellie and Dina's relationship. The truly confusing element of this segment, however, is how the developers decided to give the player control of Abby at all. As for why I find it perplexing, that will become apparent when we discuss Abby's segment and its narrative necessity, or rather, lack thereof. But now let's talk about perhaps the most divisive element of the prologue segment, and for me, the entire game, and that is of course Joel's death. Now while many fans were quite PO'd that Joel was killed so early in the game, let alone at all, I for one had expected it for quite some time. His character arc was effectively concluded in the first game, and thus I assumed he would either be featured in the second game to a greatly reduced capacity, or be killed off before its main events, leaving Ellie to grapple with his lie at the end of the first game. When the first trailer of the game was released, and it was clear the game's story would revolve around a quest for revenge, it only bolstered my theory. As for the trailers where we see Joel and Ellie interact, I thought these scenes were Joel appearing to Ellie as a sort of mental projection a la Six Feet Under. A metaphor used to demonstrate Ellie's processing of her lack of reconciliation with Joel before his death. But it turns out that all of those scenes we saw of Joel and Ellie interacting either had Joel and Ellie rendered differently or were just completely fake. Something I feel is the subject of an ethical argument that I'll save for another time. For those who weren't turned off by Joel's death in and of itself, as they understood its narrative function, many were primarily upset at its execution, namely how Joel and Tommy allowed themselves to be ambushed so easily. Per his characterization in the first game, Joel is not one to take any chances in terms of jeopardizing his own survival or the survival of those he cares about. This is even demonstrated briefly in the prologue of the first game communicating that Joel already had this sort of pragmatic survival instinct even before the outbreak. When we catch up with him 20 years later, we see that Joel has become hardened by his new world. A man who seldom trusts anyone and does whatever he can to avoid putting himself in situations where he could be rendered vulnerable, both physically and emotionally. Considering this, I did find Joel being ambushed by the WLF group to be rather jarring. Now some have argued that due to Joel's relationship with Ellie, he has sort of regressed a bit from his hardcore survivalist mentality, and become a bit more complacent. But I would argue that this is a fallacious argument. If anything, I would argue that Joel's love for Ellie would only increase his mistrust and skepticism of others, seeing as he now not only cares for his own safety and survival, but for hers, probably even more so. There is a scene that is shown late in the game, but that takes place before Joel's death, where Jesse mentions that Joel is quite strict when it comes to patrols, particularly when Ellie is out and about. Others have argued that Joel's apparent complacency is due to his time spent within the guard walls of the Jackson settlement. We see that Joel was a loved and respected member of the community, so perhaps he has left his old abrasive disposition behind. However, again, I would argue that those who make this argument are actually fighting against their own position. If Joel has grown to care for the members of the Jackson settlement, wouldn't this make him even more skeptical of outsiders? It is made evident that Joel has helped bring outsiders into the community and assimilate, but surely this would have been after a substantial vetting period to make sure they are not a threat to those in the settlement, right? Wouldn't Joel's love for his community make him even more suspicious as to what a large armed group is doing so close to the settlement? Also consider Joel most likely knows that there may be residual members of the Fireflies still out there who know about Ellie and may be searching for her. Thus, he most likely is extra wary of anyone who happens upon the settlement. But all in all, I don't think that this is that big of a deal. 
I would have liked a bit more confirmation that the writers did intend for Joel to be characterized as more complacent due to his time in Jackson, but I don't think it was fatal to the narrative. It simply feels a bit rushed. Considering, since we do not interact with the older Joel to a substantial degree before he saves Abby, the last impression we have of him is the hardened Joel from part one. It turns out that the original concept would have had Abby become a member of the Jackson community, staying with them for a certain amount of time, before betraying Joel, most likely by somehow luring him into an ambush. So it seems like even the writers felt like they would have originally needed a bit more time to have the player buy that the WLF group could get the drop on Joel. But again, I think a lot of people harp a bit too much on this point. I think it could have been done better, but I really don't think it is that big of a deal and isn't nearly as egregious as some of the far more blatantly inconsistent character moments featured in the game. However, the true failure regarding this plot point is not Joel's death at the hands of Abby and her group itself, but rather the fact that the ironic twist of Joel saving Abby, something that could have been used to incredible thematic effect, is ultimately wasted, turning what could have been a brilliant twist into a contrivance. We will discuss this in detail when we get to Abby's segment. After Joel is killed, the narrative then relies on a number of odd contrivances in order to kick off the main plot. The first being the fact that the WLF group doesn't kill Ellie and Tommy. While later in the game we see that the character Manny tries to kill Ellie and Tommy, but is stopped by Owen, which makes perfect sense given his characterization and later absconding from the WLF, and Abby, which doesn't make really all that much sense given her characterization, which we will get into later, it is rather hard to believe that the other members of the group would not overrule them. The group did only come here for Joel, sure, but by leaving Ellie and Tommy alive, they have only left themselves open to retaliation, since Ellie and Tommy have seen all of their faces and they are wearing their group's insignia out in the open, as Ellie notes. Hell, there is even a short exchange where Mel, who is said to be pregnant, tells Tommy her goddamn name. Perhaps I could see them leaving Ellie alive, as they may not consider her a threat, something that would sit nicely with Dina's line from later in the game, but why would they possibly leave Tommy alive? Given that Tommy is an ex-Firefly, the WLF members must be aware of Tommy's history and capabilities. Perhaps they didn't expect him to come for revenge, which seems like a silly assumption for them to make when you consider Abby has been pursuing Joel for half a decade. I wasn't able to ascertain if there was some sort of tier system within the group and Abby was the ranking member and thus made the final call, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And again, even if that were the case, Abby letting Ellie and Tommy go doesn't really make sense based on her later characterization. Perhaps the group felt as though the Jackson settlement, even at full force, would not stand a chance against the massive WLF community we see later in the game if they decided to come for revenge. But this is a bit of a well-maybe argument. It's me trying to explain away what is a rather contrived plot point by offering a well-maybe sort of explanation. The honest answer is that the group decided to leave them alive because otherwise the story would be over before it begins. It isn't a massive narrative-breaking plot point, but it is quite contrived and I would argue it to some extent strips the impact of a similar scene later in the narrative, but we'll get to that later. And it is a bit of a letdown, as it could have been fixed quite easily. Perhaps Manny and Owen argue over killing Tommy and Ellie in order to cover their tracks and prevent retaliation. The group overrules Owen and decides to kill them, but just then, a pack of infected storms the house, forcing the group to flee and leave Ellie and Tommy for dead. But Ellie and Tommy are able to escape with their lives. It still would have been a bit plot devicey, but it works a hell of a lot better. We then cut to Ellie and Tommy discussing their plans for revenge, or rather lack thereof. While Ellie is gung-ho about going after the group, Tommy is hesitant. He states they would not be able to amass enough people to go after the group without leaving their home vulnerable, but Ellie is adamant about hunting them down. Whether or not Tommy holds the same immediate drive to get vengeance, and he is merely concealing it, is not readily apparent. Keep this in mind as it will be important when discussing Tommy's disposition change towards the end of the game. One of the main things that struck me about this scene is the fact that Ellie's motivation for wanting revenge is rather unclear. I know that sounds silly when put like that, her motivation is obviously to avenge Joel. But consider the circumstances. 
I am sure everyone in the community of Jackson wants revenge for Joel's death, given their love for him. But as Tommy says, they have no idea the size of the WLF, how well armed they are, or even if they are, where they think they are. Even if it were just the group of about a dozen or so that were present at Joel's death, Ellie would basically stand no chance against them flying solo. The reason I find this rather odd is at the time, I was at a loss as to what exactly was driving Ellie to go on what is ostensibly a suicide mission. It just seemed like Ellie just wanting straight up vengeance for Joel's death, despite their love for one another, was rather thin as her main character motivation. Also consider the ramifications of Ellie's quest. Even if Ellie ends up finding and killing all of those who had a hand in Joel's death, what is to stop the entire WLF from rolling up on Jackson for their revenge? Considering that Ellie ends up killing not just a good amount of the members of Abby's group, but potentially, Lord knows how many WLF members throughout the game. The fact that the extremely compassionate and empathetic Ellie wouldn't take this into account and would put her own vengeance over the safety of everyone she has come to know over the past several years seems quite out of character. It felt to me like there was something else driving Ellie, aside from her just wanting vengeance. As we learn later on in the narrative, Ellie and Joel had a massive falling out due to Joel's lie at the end of the first game. So as the narrative went on, it seemed that the writers were trying to communicate via the Joel and Ellie flashbacks that the reason Ellie was so adamant about hunting Joel's killers was not just because she wanted revenge, but because she was plagued with guilt over their falling out. And the fact that he died before their reconciliation slowly eats away at her, which is seemingly confirmed when we see the flashback of Ellie's final words, or what we believe are her final words at the time, to Joel immediately before she decides to head out to hunt down Abby for the second time. And thus, it seemed like Ellie didn't just want revenge for Joel, but rather her quest for vengeance was in response to her inner turmoil as a result of her last words to Joel being so harsh. Even though this is sort of nerfed at the very end of the game, but once again, we'll get to that. This is an example of how not just what information is presented to the player, but when said information is presented is so vital. Because we don't receive the exact details of the falling out between Ellie and Joel until later in the narrative, it was, at least for me, difficult to fully empathize with Ellie's drive, at least initially, since it seemed like there was something deeper going on that the player was not tapped into. On some level, I actually think this was clever on the writer's part, to give Ellie a sort of concealed ulterior motivation that is slowly revealed over the course of the narrative. But when you take into account how this meshes, or rather does not mesh, with both the intentions of the writers and Abby's playable segment, it becomes a rather baffling decision. Again, we will discuss this a little bit later on. However, all of the critiques I have mentioned thus far pale in comparison to the insane plot point that occurs next. The next morning, Ellie and Dina learn from Maria that Tommy instructed her to keep Ellie and Jackson while he goes after Joel's killers. This helps give Tommy's quest more drive as it is no longer just about avenging Joel, but also preventing Ellie from doing something rash and getting herself killed. Which works especially well since, per the game's opening, Tommy knows the extent of what Joel did to ensure her survival. However, this is squandered when Maria, instead of honoring Tommy's wish and keeping Ellie and Jackson, allows her and Dina to head to Seattle. So Maria, who was asked by her husband to keep Ellie safe, allows Ellie and Dina to leave Jackson and instructs them to bring Tommy home. Maria is clearly knowledgeable about Tommy's capabilities as a hunter and survivalist. So even if she thought he would most likely get himself killed, what exactly was she thinking sending Ellie and Dina, who clearly have far less experience than Tommy, after him? In the first game, Maria's defining characteristic was her dedication to keeping her people safe. She was even initially against merely taking Ellie off Joel's hands and delivering her to the Fireflies. And yet now part two asks us to believe that this pragmatic and cautious woman would allow two teenage members of her community, one of whom she has most likely grown to care for as a surrogate niece, who is clearly in extreme emotional distress, to go on what is practically a suicide mission to bring back her husband, who is most likely far more equipped and experienced enough to handle himself, who would most likely be furious at her for doing the one thing he requested she not do by allowing Ellie 
to put herself in extreme danger. I think the writers were trying to frame this as Maria thinking they would just go to Seattle and bring Tommy home, but considering how Maria says she knows Ellie so well, a line that I suppose is meant to explain her decision, but really just comes off as quite hollow, does Maria actually think Ellie would just be like, okay, Tommy, t time to come home, rather than joining him on his revenge quest and thus maybe getting all three of them killed? And even if they hardly knew each other, wouldn't Maria be smart enough if she wanted to send someone to bring Tommy home safe, to not send literally the single most emotionally compromised person on the face of the planet? I don't understand why they didn't just have Maria do what Tommy asked of her and lock Ellie up, and then have Dina rescue her, or just have Ellie break free on her own. This was an absolutely ridiculous turn, considering the writers basically destroyed the consistency of Maria's characterization over the course of a single scene despite the fact that she only has about two to three minutes of screen time throughout the entire franchise. Suffice to say, this did not make me optimistic about the quality of the writing going into the second act of the game. Anyway, as silly as it is, Maria allows Ellie and Dina to head for Seattle and thus begins the second main segment of the game. Before we begin our recap of Ellie's playable segment, I want to quickly discuss the positive response the game's story received from, of course, many fans, but primarily media journalists and some fellow YouTube critics. Upon reading and or viewing many of the positive reviews of the game from larger publications and or video essayists, I have tried to avoid primarily negative reviews as much as I can in order to prevent myself from letting their arguments influence my own. It seems like most of them praise the game for its themes and audacious narrative decisions but don't take a deep dive into how successful the developers were in meshing them into a coherent story. This was also evident in the widespread critical acclaim HBO's Watchmen received upon its airing. For those of you who have not seen my analysis of the series, my main contention was that despite the show writers exploring such themes as the United States' history with racism and generational trauma, making the show appear to be quite progressive, if you actually break down the text I would argue that the show, most likely unintentionally, is actually incredibly regressive. And yet, instead of recognizing this, the majority of critics heap praise upon the show due to the touted themes without really going any deeper than a surface level analysis. And I see a similar thing happening with The Last of Us Part 2. Many have lauded the game for exploring themes such as revenge, loss, grief, and empathy, and yet most don't really discuss how the game executes its examination of and how the structural choices support said themes. I often heard reviewers speak about what the developers were trying to do, as opposed to analyzing how successfully they pull it off. If they did, they would most likely realize that the ways in which the writers go about meshing the themes of the story with the narrative structure don't work, and in fact lead to a lot of seemingly contradicting or just flat out incoherent intentions, thus resulting in an insanely disjointed experience something I hope this review will draw attention to. Anyway, let's continue. Ellie's main playable segment begins with her and Dina arriving on the outskirts of Seattle. They enter the city and soon catch wind of Tommy's trail. They are ambushed by WLF members, including Jordan, one of the men in Abby's original group from the beginning of the game, but are able to kill Jordan and make their escape. Their next objective is to reach a TV station where they hope to find another member of Abby's group Leia, but upon arriving, find that she has already been killed. However, Ellie finally discovers the name of the woman who struck the killing blow on Joel. The one she has come here to find and kill? Abby. Upon taking refuge in an abandoned theater, Dean discovers that Ellie is immune due to seeing her inhale spores, and Ellie discovers that Dina is pregnant. The next day, Ellie sets off on her own to try and track down Tommy. She runs into Jesse, who has followed her and Dina to Seattle, and they return to the theater where Dina and Jesse are reunited, leaving Ellie just a tad cucked. Ellie's next objective is to track down Nora, another member of Abby's group, who she learns is most likely at the city hospital. Upon confronting Nora, Ellie gives chase and eventually corners her as she succumbs to the effects of the cordyceps infection. Ellie tortures Nora to death in order to ascertain the location of Abby, resulting in her mental state deteriorating further. The next day, 
Ellie and Jesse set off for Abby's supposed location, the local aquarium, hoping to find Tommy. En route, Jesse prioritizes locating Tommy while Ellie is dead set on getting to Abby. Ellie arrives at the aquarium to find Owen and Mel. During a struggle, Ellie shoots Owen and stabs Mel, whom Ellie then discovers is pregnant. Ellie begins to panic when Tommy and Jesse arrive. Upon returning to the theater, Tommy, Jesse, and Ellie agree they must return home for Dina's sake. But Abby shows up, kills Jesse, holds Tommy and Ellie at gunpoint, and then we all know what happens next. Let's backtrack and discuss Ellie's segment. When isolated from, well, what happens next, Ellie's playable segment is actually pretty damn solid, though it does have a number of large weak spots. Let's start with what works. The progression of Ellie's descent into revenge-fueled borderline madness is paced magnificently, most notably due to the use of flashbacks that detail her falling out with Joel. During the first flashback, we are treated to a beautiful memory of Joel taking Ellie to a museum for her birthday. We recall their love for one another and hope that it may lead to her to abandon her quest and return home. But by the end of the sequence, we realize what the true purpose of these flashbacks is to showcase the dissolution of Ellie and Joel's relationship. This works so damn well as it begins to completely recontextualize Ellie's motivation for seeking vengeance. As I said, I found the idea of Ellie just wanting vengeance due to her love for Joel rather thin, especially considering that her seeking said vengeance is the absolute last thing Joel would want her to do. But once it is slowly revealed that they had a massive falling out years prior to Joel's death, everything became crystal clear. Ellie's journey is not one of seeking vengeance, but one of trying to dispel the immense grief and guilt she holds as a result of her and Joel not reconciling before his death. This is further cemented when we see the later flashback of her castigating Joel the night before his untimely demise. Imagine knowing your final words to someone so special in your life were of hate and malice. How could you ever possibly process the fact that you would never be able to make amends? And that is exactly what Ellie is dealing with throughout her playable segment. Even after she kills Nora and receives no comfort from doing so, her death only sending her deeper into despair, Ellie still obsessively hunts Abby. It is blatantly apparent that Ellie knows that she will not receive peace by killing those responsible for Joel's death, and yet she doesn't know what else to do. She is desperately looking for an answer, something that will allow her to reconcile her grief and consider just how well this falls in line with her characterization in the first game. Ellie believed that by getting to the Fireflies, it would make everything worth it, that it would give sense and purpose to all the trauma and pain and suffering she and so many others have been subjected to. And then she was told there was no answer, no way to reconcile said loss, and despite her attempts to suppress her anguish, it eventually resurfaces, which in turn leads to her falling out with Joel. Even when we catch up with her at age 19, Ellie doesn't have the same brightness and optimism we remember from the first game. How could she? She is trying her best to find fulfillment and joy in her life, all the while living with the knowledge that the one person she had left in her heart, the one person who she could hold on to so that she wouldn't be alone, was the one who robbed her of said purpose. It is a brilliant examination of Ellie's character and one I cannot praise enough. My biggest fear when the general details of the game originally came to light was that the writers were going to be too hesitant to allow Ellie to sink to the depths she would need to in order to deliver a compelling narrative. I think I can speak for most when I say that Ellie became perhaps one of the most universally likable and beloved characters in perhaps gaming history after the release of Part 1. A trash-talking young girl who breaks free from cliché tropes when we come to realize just how much rests on her shoulders. Ellie has had every single person she cares about taken away from her, which is only exacerbated by the fact that she is perhaps the one person on the face of the planet who has been given the gift of immunity. But due to it resulting in her surviving while others around her fall victim to the infection, while her miraculous immunity may seem like a gift from God by most, to Ellie it is nothing but a curse. When she is given hope, after being told that her immunity may lead to a vaccine, possibly saving countless lives and giving meaning to the deaths of all those she has lost along the way, she is ready to give whatever it takes, even her own life, to make it so. But in the end, it is the very person she has come to love most in this world who prevents her from giving sense to all she has lost. 
and due to her fear of being alone and her love for the damaged man standing in front of her, she puts it to bed. With all of that said, I was worried the writers would make Ellie a bit of a Supergirl-esque hero as she pursued her quest for vengeance. But I was pleasantly surprised when the writers allowed her to become a truly deep and complex character without fear of making her unlikable, unsympathetic, and downright selfish at times. The highlight for me being when Ellie opts to hunt down Abby at the aquarium instead of going with Jesse to meet up with Tommy. We see Ellie put her own selfish desire for vengeance over saving a man who has always done right by her and is only in this deadly situation in an attempt to keep her safe. It was a brilliant moment that showed me the writers were not afraid to throw their punches when it came to respecting Ellie's character development. Keep in mind that I am currently disregarding all of the times the writers do pull their punches, which completely undermine the narrative, but we'll discuss those later. Ellie's arc in her playable segment is so damn good that I can almost forgive the entire segment for where it goes wrong, but it does indeed go wrong, namely via the characterization and development, or lack thereof, of Dina and Jesse. It's always a risky endeavor to introduce new major characters in a series where the player most likely has become so attached to the existing ones, as it can be difficult to get the player invested in them rather than just seeing them as distractions. But the writers did a fantastic job with both Dina and Jesse, making them both likable and non-intrusive to the story. Dina was particularly a highlight. When the game began, I have to say there were moments where I found Dina to be a bit annoying as I presume she was just going to act as a stock romantic interest character. Later on, when she and Ellie get to Seattle, I was a bit confused as to why Dina was behaving as if Ellie's rage-filled revenge mission was akin to a school field trip. But when it was revealed she was pregnant, and we begin to see a more vulnerable side to her, I realized that Dina's more carefree attitude was a way for her to cope with her own fear and perhaps to help Ellie through her own grief. Especially considering Dina knows how Ellie feels, given the loss of her sister, Talia. However, we also see a noticeable character flaw in Dina when she tells Ellie the reason she didn't tell her about her maybe being pregnant was because she didn't want to be a burden. As for Jesse, while he is not given the most in-depth characterization, he is all around likable and proves himself to be a loyal friend. Unfortunately, while they had great potential, Dina and Jesse are criminally underutilized, both on individual terms and how they factor in to Ellie's journey. Let's start with Dina. The story does a great job of setting up Ellie and Dina's love for one another, and by the time we get to the end of day one, a clear potential conflict has been set up. Dina has come with Ellie to Seattle in order to support her, but due to her pregnancy, it now becomes a question of whether or not Ellie is going to put Dina's safety ahead of her own desire for retribution. But unfortunately, this really isn't developed or put at the forefront of the narrative. Given Ellie's fear of being alone and how her quest for vengeance seems to be at odds with keeping her relationship with Dina intact, I expected to see the fallout between these two be the central focus of their time together. This is eventually featured, but not until way late in the game after they return to Jackson. The scene between Dina and Ellie towards the end of the game is fantastic, my favorite moment being when Ellie tells Dina she isn't like her, meaning she isn't able to just let the deaths of her loved ones go but Dina has lost her sister and Jesse, yet understands that the fact that she is in pain does not give her the right to disregard those who count on her. Once again, showing just how selfish Ellie's quest for vengeance has made her become. I found this scene to be reminiscent of the cabin scene in part one, when Joel told Ellie she didn't know what real loss was, despite the fact that Ellie is more than well aware of what true loss truly is. It demonstrates just how much prioritizing one's grief can lead to one becoming a truly selfish individual, which can in turn lead to them pushing away the ones they love. Again, this moment was great, but it seems a bit strange considering that at no point before this did Dina try to convince Ellie to walk away from her quest for vengeance, even after seeing the insane mental toll it was taking on her. I can understand Dina not doing so at the beginning, considering, as we mentioned before, her passive and seemingly enabling personality, driving her to not wanting to be a burden, but it is difficult to believe that Dina, who supposedly cares for Ellie so much, at no point is able to see just how deep Ellie is sinking into despair. Dina urging Ellie to give up her quest could have been the catalyst for their eventual falling out by the end of the narrative. Given Ellie's fear of being alone 
It would be tragically ironic if her quest was the one thing that was driving the woman she loves away from her. This is even more baffling when you consider the scene in the synagogue. Dina speaks of her sister Talia, who was devoutly religious, and brought Dina to the synagogue to pray. Dina speaks of how she still prays occasionally as a way to deal with her grief in a healthy way that allows her to get through the dark times, which again makes it baffling as to why she is not trying to help bring Ellie out of her own grief. There are moments where Dina shows concern for Ellie's safety, but it never gets driven home, and Dina sadly becomes more or less a prop from day one onward until the epilogue. There were other elements of their relationship that seem to have been left by the wayside as well. Dina's pregnancy sort of comes into play in the short scene after Jesse arrives where Ellie seems to fear that she may be losing Dina to Jesse because of the baby, but it really isn't addressed or developed from there on out, nor does it even seem to cause all that much tension between Ellie and Jesse. The revelation of Ellie's immunity also gets dropped almost immediately as soon as it gets brought up. I'm not sure exactly how they could have had it factor into their relationship, but it just seemed odd how inconsequential it ends up being. All in all, the true dirty done to Dina was that she was not given more time to shine. As for Jesse, while as I said he was given some good characterization and shared an excellent character be with Ellie, unfortunately, he too was left by the wayside, particularly in regard to a conversation he and Ellie share later in her playable segment. On their way to find Tommy on day three, before they go their separate ways, Jesse asks Ellie what is to stop the WLF from retaliating against Jackson if they are able to take out Abby and her group. Ellie gives quite the confounding answer. She states that the WLF are worse people than the Jacksonites, citing that Joel and Tommy helped Abby in the prologue while the WLF tried to shoot them on sight, which would only mean they would probably be far more likely to come and lay waste to Jackson, but Ellie doesn't seem to put two and two together. Obviously her backwards logic is meant to demonstrate that Ellie is so lost in vengeance that she doesn't seem to realize, or maybe even purposefully ignores, that her quest could very well bring the hammer down upon Jackson. As I noted, this seemingly is in sharp contrast to the extremely empathetic and selfless Ellie of part one, but works well to show just how far Ellie has descended into despair. With that said, it is rather odd that none of the other characters, namely Maria, Dina and Jesse seem to realize this or bring it out to Ellie before this point. Wouldn't Maria, being the responsible leader that she is, realize that sending Ellie and Dina after Tommy may not only result in their deaths, but retaliation from the WLF? Wouldn't Dina try to urge the woman she loves to deal with her grief in a healthy and productive way and not enable her on her revenge quest, which is clearly having horribly destructive effects on her? when she herself has been able to move past her own grief? Wouldn't Jesse attempt to urge Ellie to stop her quest as it may lead to the WLF coming back to Jackson and killing his entire family? Keep in mind this isn't just me playing a game of whataboutism. The game brings attention to these elements, but doesn't develop them. And said elements, particularly the ones regarding Dina and Jesse, could have been used to excellent thematic effect. Dina could have traveled to Seattle with Ellie with the intention of making her return home and deal with her grief with those she cares about. But as Ellie's vengeance takes hold, we begin to see her push Dina away. Jesse arrives in Seattle with the intent of bringing Ellie and Dina home so as not to have them cause the WLF to retaliate against Jackson, which would give him a solid individual character drive. But when Ellie refuses, their friendship begins to deteriorate as Jesse sees just how selfish Ellie has allowed herself to become. We see Ellie's greatest fear, ending up alone, coming to fruition. Not due to external forces, but due to her inability to process her grief in a healthy way. But ultimately, unfortunately, Dina is mostly sidelined after day one, and Jesse is pretty much just a tag along Timmy for when he shows up until he gets domed. But all in all, despite the criminal underutilization of Dina and Jesse, my overall impression of Ellie's segment is a resoundingly positive one. A horrific study of watching one of the most beloved and cherished video game characters in recent memory, and perhaps of all time, sink to the lowest depths of her own morality as she lets her immense grief, not just for the death of the man whom she discovers told her a monstrous lie, but also the deaths of every person who died because of Joel's decision and the incredible weight that is thrust upon her knowing they have all perished 
due to the fact that she is still breathing to this very day. I have to give the writers credit where credit is due. They did not pull their punches here and allowed Ellie to sink to the depths she needed to in order to give us a truly captivating experience. But now it's time to talk about what happens next. Four people are sitting around the table talking about baseball, whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off, blows the people to smithereens. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information that in five minutes time, that bomb will go off. Now the conversation about baseball becomes very vital because they're saying to you, don't be ridiculous, stop talking about baseball, there's a bomb under there. You've got the audience working. <laughs> Look, let me drop this whole measured take objective analysis BS and tell you my true honest to God feelings about what comes next. Just at the height of the narrative climax of Abby holding Tommy and Ellie at gunpoint, the game suddenly cuts to black and we begin what will be a six to eight hour journey in the shoes of Abby, the woman who killed Joel, who set Ellie off on her march to moral corruption. And, as for my honest to God, no holds barred thoughts on Abby's playable segment, it's pretty okay. While I haven't really delved into the more resoundingly negative reviews of the game here on YouTube, based on the impressions many expressed via the likes of Twitter and other social media, the general gist of how most felt about Abby's segment is that it is in and of itself fine, if not a bit underdeveloped and sort of a rehash of the first game's main character arc. The main contention most had, to varying intensity, was how it meshes with the rest of the narrative. And yet it seems evident to me that a lot of people who criticize how the game is structured, or even those who praise the game, but do concede that the structure of the narrative is in many ways detrimental to the overall experience, don't delve into just how destructive the switch is to the pacing, tension, and overall thematic messaging. But we'll save that shit show for a little later. Let's recap Abby's playable segment. We begin with a flashback where we see Abby interact with her father, whom it is revealed was the surgeon Joel killed at the conclusion of the first game, in order to save Ellie. Abby sets out on her journey to hunt down and kill the one who took her father from her, which she ends up accomplishing several years later. We follow up with Abby at the Seattle WLF base sometime after she returns from Jackson, where we meet most of the characters whom we are introduced to in the prologue of the game, most of whom Ellie offs at some point during her playable segment, and establish the current conflict the WLF finds itself in. The WLF, led by the intimidating Isaac, is in a fierce battle against the Seraphites, a cult of religious zealots whom we encountered briefly in Ellie's segment. Isaac is planning a final assault on the Seraphites to end their conflict once and for all, but Abby's attention is focused elsewhere. It turns out that her love interest Owen, whom we met in the prologue, has seemingly gone rogue. Abby, knowing where Owen is probably hiding out, sets out to meet with him. On her way, she is taken prisoner by a group of Seraphites, and is saved by two deserters of the cult, siblings Yara and Lev. The three of them work together and make it to safety. Abby then sets off to the aquarium where she finds Owen, who says he is done with the WLF and plans to meet up with the resurgence of the Fireflies off the coast of Santa Barbara. After a night of smashing, Abby has a dream of Yara and Lev being killed and, apparently suffering from a guilty conscience due to them saving her life, goes back for them. Abby brings the horribly injured Yara to the aquarium to find Owen and the newly arrived Mel. Yara needs to have her broken arm amputated and thus Abby and Lev make their way to the hospital in order to get the needed supplies. Upon returning and patching Yara up, the group plans on making their way to the Fireflies. However, just as they are getting ready to leave, Lev returns to the Seraphite Island to try and convince his mother to come with them. 
Abby and Yara head to the island just as the WLS assault begins. They find Lev, who sadly was forced to kill his own mother in self-defense. They try to escape, but are confronted by Isaac and other members of the WLF. Yara kills Isaac before she is killed herself, and Abby and Lev make a daring escape just as the island is engulfed in flames. Abby and Lev return to find Owen and Mel dead and Ellie's map, which she accidentally left behind. Abby travels to the theater to confront Ellie, and we catch up to where we left off at the end of Ellie's segment. So let's leave it right there for a moment. So as I said, Abby's segment is okay. There are some truly breathtaking and horrifyingly entertainment moments and some boring and monotonous moments. The chemistry between Abby and Lev was fantastic and entertaining, and yet Abby's love triangle storyline was kind of meh, especially considering we just saw a similar arc play out between Ellie, Dina, and Jesse. There were moments of hilarity, the moment that made me laugh the most in the entire game being, What's going on between you and your friend Owen? Oh my god, Lev, now? And then there were some, how do I say, unintentionally hilarious moments. Are you wearing my backpack? <laughs> Overall, it was a mixed bag that unfortunately came off as more of a wired down version of the Joel Ellie arc in the first game. But let's actually take a deeper dive and discuss some of the more intrinsic storytelling problems in Abby's segment. The first big strike against Abby's segment is the fact that after we cut away from the climactic theater scene and catch up with day one Abby, there is no forward narrative drive. By that I don't just mean the game literally brings the narrative to its highest tension point and then immediately rips you away, but also when we begin Abby's segment, we literally have no grasp on her life in Seattle and there seems to be no immediate conflict Abby is engaged in, so the game has to spend time building that up, setting up the looming Seraphite assault, Owen going AWOL, so the pacing of the story is done no favors by the writers introducing Abby's segment like this, although it seems more of an issue with the overall structure rather than her segment in and of itself. Things pick up, however, when Abby is rescued by Yara and Lev and decides to go back for them, but here is where we run into our first major Abby story problem that is borderline fatal to the entire segment. Abby's decision to go back for Yara and Lev is completely arbitrary. Abby does have a dream about Yara and Lev being killed by the Seraphites, but this feels extremely random and forced. It feels like something that just happens because the story needs Abby to go back for them. Well, yeah, but they saved Abby's life, so surely she would feel guilty if she didn't, right? Well, you would think so, but this idea is completely and utterly contradicted by... Earlier I spoke of how the ironic twist of Joel saving Abby was wasted, and this is precisely what I was talking about. In the prologue of the game, Joel saves Abby, which leads to the ambush at the lodge. However, if you replay this segment, you will realize that Abby shows literally zero hesitation about shooting, torturing, and ultimately killing the man who just saved her life. With that said, it is very odd to have the entire crux of Abby's arc be her literally leaving everything she knows behind to repay the people who saved her life when she had no problem torturing Joel to death. Now, of course, Joel is the man who killed her father, but it is strange that the writers didn't seem to have Abby reflect on the fact that this man, this monster she has been building up in her head for years, that has been the demon in her nightmares and has driven her to become a hate-fueled killing machine, that the first thing she witnesses him doing is save her life. It seemed odd that there wasn't the character beat of Abby's quest for vengeance being offended by a single selfless act. And it makes it even worse when you consider that had Abby been given said character beat, it would then set up her eventual decision to rescue Yara and Lev perfectly. Imagine a scenario where upon entering the lodge, Abby tells Owen she has changed her mind and no longer wants to kill Joel. This could be a conversation only revealed at the beginning of Abby's segment, keeping in line with the story's concept of playing with perspective. However, after being goaded on by Manny and the others, specifically after they remind her of what Joel did to her father, Abby goes through at the killing. However, her reluctance to do so would then make her sparing Ellie and Tommy an easier pill to swallow. Upon returning to Seattle, Abby is plagued with guilt for killing Joel, seeing as he saved her life, which in turn makes her decision to go back and save Yara and Lev a lot more narratively sound. Again, it is just difficult to believe a character that showed absolutely no remorse when she shot, tortured, and killed a man who moments before saved her life 
would then, over the course of about 36 hours, decide to go on several life-threatening endeavors in order to save Yara and Lev. This not only makes the most crucial decision made by Abby that acts as the foundation of her entire character arc completely arbitrary, but it also means that, as I said before, the ironic twist of Joel saving Abby was basically pointless and ends up being a contrivance. In the prologue, Owen mentions that the Jackson community is too big for them to lead an assault on, and thus, had Joel and Tommy not come across Abby, then she wouldn't have been able to ambush him, and thus, there would be no story. Since Joel saving Abby never comes into play thematically, it feels like the writers just didn't know how else for his death scene to take place, so they just had them run into each other. I have seen some argue that Joel's death actually did play a role in Abby's decision to go back for Yara and Lev, given the fact that the story Owen tells her of the old Seraphite man whom he refused to kill, which led to him going AWOL, seems to be reminiscent of Joel's death at the beginning of the game. This story is great and sits well with Owen's character, as even before Joel's death, Owen was low-key trying to get Abby to turn around and head back to Seattle, but this is Owen's character beat. He does throw Abby's selfishness in her face about killing Joel, but again trying to connect Joel's death as the inciting incident of Abby deciding to go back for Yara and Lev is quite the stretch, seeing as at no point does it seem like Abby feels any hint of remorse for killing Joel, nor is it ever communicated whether or not Abby attaining her vengeance has given her any semblance of satisfaction or peace. I suppose there is the fact that Abby's trouble sleeping doesn't seem to subside even after she kills Joel, thus making it seem like his death has brought her no peace, although this really isn't communicated as well as it could have been. Aside from the short scene right at the beginning of her segment and her convo with Mel in the truck, inferring that her trouble sleeping is as a result of Joel's death failing to dispel her grief, Abby never reflects on the fact that Joel's death didn't do anything to quell her despair. Had we perhaps seen a nightmare sequence right at the beginning of Abby's section, right before she is woken up by Manny, or maybe she brings it up to Owen at the aquarium before they bump uglies, that would drive the point home. At first I thought the flashback of Abby finding her father dead was a nightmare she experienced right before she was woken up by Manny, but upon rewatching the segment, it seems like the flashback of Abby finding her father dead was simply for the audience. But even if we are able to infer that Abby's grief has not been dispelled by killing Joel, the fact that Abby feels absolutely zero remorse for Joel's death seems odd considering her going back for Yara and Lev is the foundation of her entire arc. Again, such a shame considering that not only would Abby feeling guilt over Joel's death due to him rescuing her serve as an excellent and coherent inciting incident for her character trajectory, but thematically it would work so well, as Joel's death would incite the moral degeneration of one character and the moral redemption of another. The fact that this connection isn't made makes the parallel stories even more disjointed than they already are. Abby's interactions with Lev on their way to the hospital are a highlight of her section, injecting a bit of levity into what is an overall grim and depressing affair. I also feel Lev's storyline was handled well, and that Lev is an example of representation done right. Lev being trans doesn't completely encapsulate his role in the story, and thus he feels like an actual character as opposed to a token. Also, I want to give a quick little note to those who are apparently pissed off that in the game, a number of the Seraphites use Lev's dead name by calling him Lily. Well, yeah, they're part of an oppressive religious cult. That's, that's, that's the whole reason Lev and Yara left was because they were crazy ass zealots that didn't respect Lev's identity. How, how do you, god damn it. The game then has Abby enter the hospital on her own where she ends up facing off against the Rat King, which is a hell of a sequence, but does ultimately feel like padding for two main reasons in retrospect. One, since we ultimately know Yara ends up getting patched up only to die a little later on, playing the game again really highlights just how inconsequential the sequence is. And two, having Abby go solo for a large portion of her run was quite the mistake, considering the entire point of her segment was to have the player identify with her. This works well when she is interacting with Lev and the others, as these interactions allow us to gauge her personality, but when she goes solo, she becomes a bit stale, like we are controlling a character whom we really don't know or identify with. 
I actually think Ellie's solo sections work well thematically, since, one, we already have so much foundational characterization of Ellie, two, the isolation we feel when playing alone as Ellie fits in well with her character arc, with her slowly drifting away from those she loves, and three, we are given so much revelatory information during her segment, it offers a lot of time to process said information and reflect on her choices and our view of her, a lot less so with Abby. I think keeping Lev with Abby for the hospital sequence would have worked better and strengthened their bond. I understand why she went in solo due to narrative restrictions, but it made the sequence a bit of a slog in what is already a slog of a segment. I'd argue trimming down Abby's time going solo would have vastly improved the segment overall. Abby returns with the medical supplies and Yara is healed. The group gets ready to make their way to Santa Barbara, and this is of course where Abby gets thoroughly BTFO'd by Mel, awesome scene. Something to mention here is that while I found the double love triangle baby daddy plots to be a bit over the top, in terms of creating parallels between Ellie and Abby, I actually think it is handled better on an individual basis in Abby's segment than it is in Ellie's. Earlier I spoke of how I found it odd that Dina never really tried to talk Ellie out of her quest for vengeance and that their relationship disintegrating was poorly paced and how Jesse, while he seemed to see the more selfish side of Ellie rearing its head, never really called her on it, despite the fact that her actions may in turn lead to all of the Jacksonites paying the cost. And yet, I saw those exact beats play out in Abby's segment. We see Owen and Abby's relationship through flashbacks and learn that it was primarily Abby's inability to let go of her vengeance that soured their romance. And the dynamic between Abby and Mel is sort of the optimal version of what could have been the dynamic between Jesse and Ellie, with Mel being the one who tells Abby just how much of a selfish person she is and how her inability to realize this has led to so much pain for others. I suppose you could say you are meant to apply the character dynamics and beats shared between Abby, Owen, and Mel to Ellie, Dina, and Jesse, but I think using different characters' beats to color other characters results in everyone's characterization being stretched a bit too thin. Anyway, after Mel emotionally dropkicks Abby, our characters discover that Lev has fled back to the Seraphite Island. Abby and Yara make their way to the island and, in what is perhaps the single best extended sequence in the game, Abby infiltrates the Seraphite camp, saves Lev, cutting her way through her own comrades to do so, and brings him to safety via a stunning horseback ride through the camp as it burns to the ground. As ultimately excellent as it was, there were a few issues I had with Abby's day three. As I said, the fact that Yara dying renders the entire hospital sequence moot makes it feel even more like padding than it already did. Isaac and the WLF as a whole, as well as the Seraphites, ended up being quite underdeveloped, and their conflict was more or less reduced to one over territory, which was a shame considering the numerous philosophical aspects to their conflict that could have been explored. During Ellie's segment, I was pretty amped to eventually meet the Seraphite prophet woman we see in murals and whatnot, but then it said she died before the events of the game. I was sort of hoping for a similar situation like in Fallout New Vegas, where we see Kaisar's Legion as a bunch of psychos for the majority of the game, but when we finally end up meeting Kaisar late in the game, he gives a compelling case for the Legion's way of life. I think it would have been great if we had met some sort of figurehead of the Seraphites, similar to Isaac of the WLF, at some point and get some insight on how the teachings of the prophet got twisted and corrupted, but sadly, that was not the case. The fact that we don't really feel the weight of Abby killing the other WLF members was a letdown. Perhaps if some of the people we are forced to kill were people we met earlier on day one, or perhaps even some of the characters who were part of her original group who travel with her to Jackson, that would have been interesting. Also, Abby doesn't even really seem to care about killing them, which seemed a bit odd. It seemed like a wasted opportunity given the potential thematic link to the rest of the game. In the final big bad boss fight, and this goes for all the Seraphite mini bosses in the game, seemed incredibly out of place. I guess the devs did this to utilize the new dodge mechanic and to set up the mechanics for the game's final confrontation, but they just dampened the realistic tone the rest of the game is going for. But all in all, the Seraphite Island sequence is absolutely astounding, so much so that I feel many can overlook some of its flaws. Upon returning to the aquarium, this is where Abby finds Owen and Mel dead, and then goes to confront Ellie at the theater, which catches us up with Ellie's segment. So let's stop right there for a second, as I am sure you have a lingering question in the back of your mind. So far, as you can see, I had a few gripes with the prologue, was overall quite positive about Ellie's segment, and was mixed to positive about Abby's segment. So what was all that about this video being a tremendously negative review of the story? 
because as I said before in the prologue section, and as Mr. Hitchcock detailed beautifully in the clip I showed you, information given to the audience is only as important and sometimes even less important than when that information is presented. The misplacement of a sequence, scene, or even a piece of dialogue can have massive effects on how the person engaging with the story reacts to it. The Ellie Joel flashbacks were an example of this technique being used purposefully and beautifully. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, Naughty Dog decided to structure the game as they did, placing Ellie's entire segment before Abby's segment. And it is an utterly cataclysmic decision that completely derives the story of its pacing, tension, and completely warps and distorts the intended contentions of the writers. I know I am sounding a bit apocalyptic here, but I cannot underestimate just how bad of a choice this was. Let's start with how the structure affects the pacing of the story. As I said, while the pacing of the prologue was a bit wonky, with the switching back and forth between Ellie and Abby, overall it wasn't a complete wash, with the player curious as to who this mysterious woman is and why we are controlling her. Abby's segment is, once again, a masterclass in pacing, as we see Ellie's deterioration slowly take hold of her over the course of three days with her decisions becoming more rash and self-destructive. Abby's segment, while it does have some issues I have already brought up, ultimately settles in well and ends with a brilliantly paced final segment. The problem is, of course, the fact that Abby's segment only begins after we have reached the climax of the Seattle storyline. The game builds it up and up and up, and then suddenly rips the player away and has them start all over again. This not only blue balls the player like a motherfucker, but as I said, since Abby is a brand new character and there is no new forward drive in her segment right away when it begins, the first few hours of her segment are even more of a slog, since not only do the writers ask us to get invested in the story of a brand new character and indulge in all the setup that entails, but they do so right after showing us the ultimate end goal of said character. In some cases, I can see this working well. Since Abby's fate is sort of set in stone, her segment plays out as much more of a march towards inevitability. The only problem is said march more than overstayed its welcome, especially during day two with the whole hospital Rat King sequence, which is a lot of fun in its own right, but is ultimately just padding. It would have been far more rewarding if Abby's segment added some more context or perhaps answered some lingering questions from Ellie's segment. But because Abby and Ellie's segments are so completely disconnected from one another, it hardly does. It gives a bit more context to the WLF and Seraphite conflict, but as I said, neither faction is thoroughly developed, so it's not like we end up getting all that much more info about either of them. We know what island that Mel and Owen are talking about when Ellie confronts them in the aquarium, but it's mostly just small details that don't add up to anything that substantially recontextualizes Ellie's segment. Again, the pacing of each individual segment is overall well done, but when put back to back, as viewed as a full story, it is an absolutely baffling decision that unfortunately, instead of giving the player reason to get invested in Abby's redemption, doesn't do enough to dull the lingering pain in the back of their head, telling them to just get back to the good part already. Next up is tension. As I said, the tension as to where Abby's segment ultimately ends up is pretty much non-existent since we know exactly where she ends up. However, this was clearly a deliberate choice by the writers and again works well if you look at it as a sort of march towards her own fate. The problem is that the tension within Abby's story on a smaller scale is completely destroyed. Obviously, we already know where Owen and Mel die. We know that Ellie never comes into contact with Abby during her journey since we know we won't actually confront her until the end of the segment and we know the fates of pretty much all the other main characters. Jesse, Tommy, and Dina, at least for the time being. This makes Abby's segment even more of a slog, as we are just going through the motions until we get to the end, and we know that none of her actions are going to have any sort of influence on any of the events we saw during Ellie's segment, thus making it feel, as many have compared it to, like a DLC of some sort. Again, if they played with this, Maybe a sequence where Ellie thinks Abby did something or it killed someone, but later it is revealed that it was not in fact Abby. I don't know, something where the writers could have had fun with their differing perspectives, it could have been more rewarding. But perhaps the most atrocious example of the structure destroying tension is the sequence where Abby and Manny confront the sniper at the marina. Now when the sequence begins, we obviously don't know who the sniper is. At the very end of the sequence, the player learns that the sniper is in fact Tommy. Now while we technically are not shown the identity of the sniper, I think it is reasonable to assume that a number of players could probably put two and two together. 
What with the sniper's identity being hidden, thus they may presume it is someone of note, we know it's not Ellie, Jesse, or Dina, since we know none of them were at the marina during this time, in Ellie's segment, and given the flashback with Tommy and Ellie, where they shoot infected together, and the WLF member mentioning a sniper at the marina in Ellie's segment, and Ellie and Jesse presuming it must be Tommy, again, I think many players may catch on to the sniper being Tommy before the sniper's identity is ultimately revealed. So, what's the problem? Well, whether or not you were able to ascertain the identity of the sniper doesn't really matter, since either way, there is literally zero tension being built in this scene. Let's say you go through the entire sequence not knowing the sniper is Tommy. When Tommy and Abby end up facing off, I'm sure you will be given quite the shock. But again, since we know Tommy is alive at the end of day three, your shock will subside rather quickly, since you know he is going to make it out of this encounter. But let's say you are able to ascertain that the sniper is Tommy. At first you may panic. Holy shit, what if that is Tommy? Am I going to have to kill Tommy as Abby? Well, no, obviously, because once again, we know Tommy is alive at the end of day three in Ellie's segment, and thus, the entire time you were going after Tommy, there's no tension. You confront Tommy, wrestle a bit, but you know he doesn't die at the hands of Abby, at least at the moment. So what exactly is the point of the marina sequence? Well, it seems it was done in order to sort of flip the script, to make you view the sniper as any other enemy you are trying to kill. But when it is revealed to be Tommy, the player is thrown for a loop, making them reconsider and reflect on their mindless drive to kill the person shooting you. The only problem is that this only works if the player doesn't realize the sniper is Tommy until the very end, which, as I stated, may not be the case for many players, considering the game mentions the sniper at the marina earlier in Ellie's segment, whom Ellie and Jesse presume is Tommy, and the fact that many players may just guess that it's Tommy. If the player realizes the sniper is Tommy, say about halfway through the sequence, then the power of the reveal at the end is stripped away. If the writers wanted this moment to be shocking, then why include the line in Ellie's segment about the sniper at the marina? Wouldn't this only result in it being more likely that the player would realize the sniper was Tommy before the reveal? It's a baffling decision. Which is even more baffling when you consider that the segment could have been vastly improved if we didn't know that Tommy makes it to the end of day three. Recall the Hitchcock speech in which he discusses how giving the audience certain information or not giving them certain information can completely warp the effect a particular scene or sequence has on them. So let's say we didn't see Tommy meet up with Ellie towards the end of her segment. Perhaps the game cut to Abby right after Ellie realizes Dina is pregnant. Obviously that wouldn't be ideal, but just bear with me for a second. Therefore, the player has no idea of Tommy's fate when we enter the marina sequence. And thus, even if the player realizes that the sniper is Tommy before the end of the sequence, the tension is still there, because we still don't know if Tommy is going to make it out of this encounter with Abby alive, and we very may well have to kill Tommy as Abby. I would say the ideal version of the sequence would be to reveal to the player about halfway through, perhaps right after Manny is killed, that the sniper is Tommy. That way you get the first half of the sequence where you are just chasing some random enemy you can't wait to kill, you get the surprise of realizing the sniper is Tommy, thus giving the sequence the intended effect won by the writers, but also you would receive the added benefit of not knowing whether or not Abby's confrontation with Tommy will lead to his death. So why did the writers decide to structure the sequence the way they did? Well, it could have just been an oversight, with them not realizing that the player knowing that Tommy survives beyond this point sort of destroys any tension in the sequence. But I think the reason is that the writers simply didn't prioritize the tension of the sequence, but rather what the purpose of the sequence was in terms of player perception. As Abby, we may mindlessly hunt down the sniper, wanting them dead more than anything. But when we realize the sniper is Tommy, suddenly we realize just how easily we got caught up in our quest to hunt the sniper down, and the reveal is meant to make us question the whole dichotomy of hero and villain. Again, this only works if you don't know the sniper is Tommy until the end, even though the game blatantly hints that it is in fact Tommy. And it would have had the same effect if we were shown the sniper was Tommy about halfway through the sequence and did not know he made it to the end of day three. But the bigger issue here is an issue I have with the game as a whole, and that is the creators prioritizing, more often than not, trying to trick or manipulate the player by using the characters as variables in an experiment, if you will. It is almost a direct illustration of Hitchcock's bomb theory, 
the writers gave you a decent sequence that ends with five seconds of shock when they could have constructed a white knuckle sequence where you were afraid you may have to kill a character you know and love. As I said, this sequence is completely devoid of any tension, and thus the ultimate goal of it is to simply make a point, but not even about the characters. It's simply about trying to fuck with the player. You could completely remove the sequence and it wouldn't change anything for the characters, except of course May's death, which in retrospect doesn't really mean anything since Owen's death is enough motivation in and of itself to send Abby after Tommy and Ellie later on, and Abby running into Manny on the marina was rather random anyway. Come to think of it, had Manny been one of the people you would have to kill as Abby later on, on the Seraphite Island, after Isaac is killed, that could have made for a hell of a sequence, given the game spent a good chunk of time building up their friendship. So why add an entire sequence that doesn't develop the characters or move the story forward in any way? One that is completely void of tension, just to try and make a point to the player, a point that has already been made several times over by this point. I have seen many praise the sequence again for what it is trying to do, but rarely do these people who praise it put it into the context of the full story. As an isolated sequence, it is fine. When put into the context of the full narrative, it is meaningless. So I have discussed how the Switch delivers near fatal blows to both the pacing and overall tension of the story. But there must have been some reason the writers decided to do this, right? There must have been some reason the writers would bring you to the climax of the story and then rewind the clock and make you play as the person you have been hunting all this time. What were the writers trying to say by doing this? Well, the answer may seem obvious, and it is, and that is part of the problem. The Switch is meant to make the player reconsider their actions in Ellie's segment by having you play and ultimately sympathize with the woman she sets out to kill. Note that I said sympathize, not empathize. I'll come back to that later. Many who have praised the game and the character Switch have noted that this seems to be the intended purpose, to make you realize that the person you have been hunting down as Ellie is actually a person with their own story and reasons for doing what they do. This is even confirmed by creator Neil Druckmann himself. We can make you experience this thirst for revenge, this thirst for retribution, and having you actually commit the acts of finding it and then showing you the other side to make you regret it, to make you feel dirty for everything you've done in the game, making you realize I am actually the villain of the story. So it seems rather clear that the intended purpose of the character switch was to make the player become invested in Ellie's desire for vengeance only to make the player reconsider their thirst for blood upon taking control of Abby, which on the surface seems interesting and bold and could be an incredible experience, despite the fact that other games have done this very thing in far more coherent manners. But here is why it fails in The Last of Us Part Two on almost every conceivable level. First off, Neil Druckmann stated that the inspiration of switching from Ellie to Abby was the character switch from the first game, where after Joel is injured, the player takes control of Ellie for the next couple of hours before switching back to Joel. However, I would argue that there are some blatantly fundamental differences that result in the character switch in the first game working while failing in the second game. In part one, the switch to Ellie makes sense in terms of the narrative. Joel is out of commission and thus Ellie must continue the story, but also, Switching to Ellie doesn't kill any tension. In part two, the game purposely rips the player away right at the climax of the action. Whereas in part one, switching to Ellie only continues the rising action of the story and thus the pacing and tension are kept intact. The switch to Ellie was also very important in terms of expressing one of the main themes of the story, but did so in an incredibly subtle and nuanced way. Up until this point, we are playing as Joel, escorting Ellie to the Fireflies, but when Joel is put out of commission and we take control of Ellie, we as the players start to realize that Ellie seems to be able to take care of herself. And there really is no reason the game could not continue with Ellie making it to the Fireflies on her own. But when we switch back to Joel at the end of the winter segment, the purpose of the switch to Ellie becomes clear. Part one was mainly about purpose, about characters, as Joel puts it, finding something to fight for. Tess died believing her death would mean something upon Ellie making it to the Fireflies. Bill had Frank until he sadly lost him. Henry had Sam, and when his purpose was taken away from him, Henry saw no other way out. Joel's purpose was Sarah until he lost her, and became the hard man we fall up with in Boston at the beginning of the game. It was only after Joel found his love for Ellie that he was able to regain that purpose. 
Ellie's purpose is of course to make it to the Fireflies in order to give meaning to the deaths of all those who were lost along the way. When laying this out, you can see what the purpose of the switch to Ellie was, to show the player that Ellie doesn't necessarily need Joel in order to fulfill her purpose. She loves him of course, but he isn't a necessary component of her journey. Whereas with Joel, Ellie is absolutely necessary. Joel needs Ellie, Ellie does not necessarily need Joel. By switching to Ellie, we realize we don't necessarily need Joel either. But when we switch back to Joel and reach the end of the game, we start to understand the purpose of the switch and how it ended up leading to Joel robbing Ellie of her purpose in order to retain his own. It was a brilliantly subversive and subtle decision that doesn't smash you over the head with its intentions, but becomes clear by the end. And nothing could be farther from the truth regarding Abby's segment. The moment the player switches to Abby, all subtlety and nuance is thrown out the window. The creators having you play as Abby in order to make you reconsider Ellie's journey for vengeance is so blatantly transparent that it is almost condescending, which in turn makes it difficult to get invested in her story in the grand scheme of the narrative since her entire segment amounts to the writers smashing you over the head with the exact same point over and over and over. And this in turn makes the fact that we play as Abby in the prologue, as I said, completely baffling. As for the intended purpose of the player playing as Abby in the prologue, according to co-writer Haley Gross, we wanted the opportunity to build empathy for her from the start. And the most effective way we can do that is to have you walking in her shoes, spending time with her, seeing what makes her vulnerable, seeing what makes her scared. We get that she's scared of heights, we get that she has a soft spot for Owen, and is upset about his romantic life. We get that there are intense stakes that might drive these two people apart. We wanted to inform all of that without you understanding that she's the prototypical antagonist. Okay, but if the entire point of switching to Abby halfway through the game was to make you reconsider the seething hatred for her you had throughout Ellie's segment, wouldn't having the audience empathize with her before she kills Joel sort of undermine that? Wouldn't it have been better if we didn't know anything about Abby before this? thus making her even more of a blank slate that we could look at with complete and utter hatred? In retrospect, I think it would have been far more effective if we had played as Joel during Abby's sections of the prologue. Imagine playing as Joel and saving Abby from the infected, only to have her repay you with a shotgun blast to the groin. Wouldn't that have been far more suited to the narrative's ultimate intentions? To make you feel a seething hatred for Abby? Another odd thing about Haley's comments about her and Druckmann wanting the player to empathize with Abby before she kills Joel is we don't actually empathize all that much with her in the prologue. Yes, we see she is afraid of heights and is mad jelly of Owen knocking up Mel, but those really don't give us a deeper insight into who she is. In order for Joel's ambush to remain a surprise, the writers had to deliberately conceal Abby's motivations for coming to Jackson, which prevents us from really empathizing with her at all. When she makes her way into Jackson on her own, we have no idea why she is doing this or what is driving her. But hey, she is afraid of heights and is thirsty for Owen. Both pieces of information that are made clear in her playable segment and offer no value in being revealed this early in the narrative before we even know Abby's name. However, this speaks to a larger problem that the writers have, namely in their understanding of empathy. And that is, empathy is not synonymous with sympathy and or likability. Both Abby's fear of heights and realizing her pining after Owen, despite his relationship with Mel, don't really tell us about who Abby is. They make us feel a bit of sympathy for her, but they don't make us empathize with her. What is so great about utilizing empathy over sympathy or likability is that when done right, you don't have to constantly be worried about your character being sympathetic or likable as long as you can keep the audience invested in your character by making their actions understandable. A character like Michael Corleone becomes a complete monster by the end of The Godfather, but we stick with his story because the path of his downfall makes complete sense. I was not sympathetic to Walter White when he rejected his ex-business partner's offer to cover his cancer treatment and decided to go back to making meth, but I understood why he did so given his established characterization. I didn't necessarily like Joel Miller's decision to strip Ellie of her purpose by slaughtering his way through waves of fireflies, thus costing the world a possible vaccine for the cordyceps infection, but given the trauma he suffered from losing his daughter 
his them or me mentality he was shown to have even before the outbreak, two decades of resorting to the lowest depths of human morality to survive, and his overall lack of faith in the redemption of the human race as a whole, his final decision makes complete glaring sense given what we know about the man Joel is. I didn't like Ellie as she allowed her grief to send her on a borderline suicide journey, disregarding the safety and concern of those who love her and only want the best for her, and later left the woman she loves and her infant child, whose father is dead because of her actions, but we get it. The game is not worried about whether or not we like Ellie, the game is simply asking us to understand her, and by understanding her, we are able to continue following her on her doomed quest to reconcile her immeasurable grief. So with all that said, the way in which the writers developed Abby, with the purported intention of making us empathize with her, is borderline inept. The writers mistook us liking Abby for empathizing with her. The writers were so insecure about the audience buying into Abby as a character that they just make her into a morally righteous heroic figure by the end of her segment. With her selflessly risking her life numerous times and leaving behind literally everything and everyone she knows in order to do right by Yara and Lev. Sure, she says she is doing it for herself rather than for them, but again, this seems like an incredibly hollow line given the incredible lengths she goes to to help them. When just looking at the events of her segment, it is difficult to not see Abby as a quote unquote good person. And yet a lot of people still didn't buy into it and didn't end up liking Abby. Well, why? Well, because while the writers made her do a lot of nice and selfless stuff, as I discussed earlier regarding her motivation for going back for Yara and Lev, her change of heart was completely arbitrary and wasn't supported by anything she goes through. As her segment continues, I would argue it becomes harder to empathize with Abby. When asked by Lev why she is doing all of this for them, she says something along the lines of lightening the load. And thus it seems like she is helping Lev and Yara as she is still struggling with her inner turmoil. But inner turmoil over what? About her father's death? Well, we don't see any of this. After she kills Joel and returns to Seattle, we never really get any indication that her killing Joel hasn't dispelled her grief outside of her saying she isn't sleeping well. Was it perhaps guilt over Joel's death, considering he saved her life? But as we went over, Abby showed no hesitation in shooting, torturing, and killing Joel, despite him rescuing her. We are never shown whether or not she feels guilt over his death. If this was communicated to the audience, then her going back for Yara and Lev would make more sense. Later in the game, Mel mentioned something about maybe Abby doing it to impress Owen or something. She may have just been talking shit, but by this point I had no idea why Abby was doing anything she was doing, so Mel could have been right for all I knew. Again, by the end of the segment, it is hard to not see Abby as a good person. But the reason a lot of players didn't buy into this is that the game doesn't tell us why Abby decides to go back for Yara and Lev. Yeah, but they saved her life. You mean like Joel did? who was then mercilessly tortured and murdered by Abby without a second thought? Again, I understand that the rage of her father's death led her to becoming consumed by vengeance, but having her kill Joel without hesitation and then asking the player to buy that she would selflessly risk her life several times over for two people she hardly knows, again, doesn't actually make her empathetic. It just makes her decision to do so incredibly arbitrary. Couple that with the fact that once we switch to Abby, the intention of the writers is blatantly, and by their own admission, to get us invested in Abby as a person, and thus her decision to do right by Yara and Lev comes off as a rather transparent way to make this happen, despite the fact that they gave little to no thought as to how they could make the audience understand why she does it. And there could have been plenty of material to work with. Maybe she felt guilty that Joel saved her life? Except she never reflects on this. Maybe she was beginning to become jaded and turned off by the WLS methods? After our morning, I wouldn't mind a few minutes with these guys. Well, guess not. The writers thought that having us see Abby as a morally great person was equitable to us empathizing with her. By the end, I could say Abby was now a good person in my eyes, but I understood her even less. What is so insane about this is that if all the writers wanted us to do was empathize with Abby, rather than liking or sympathizing with her, then all they would have to show us was this. Abby. No! Abby, don't look. Dad! Dad! If the entire point was to have us understand Abby, then all we would really need to see in order to do so is the fact that Joel killed her father. 
That completely explains why she wanted to kill Joel. Again, I didn't like her killing Joel, but I get it. We have literally spent the last several hours witnessing the intense turmoil that Ellie has been dealing with following the death of her father figure. How could we not understand? It's even weirder too, since Ellie never finds out the real reason that Abby killed Joel. She thought it was about him destroying the Firefly's only hope for a vaccine. Wouldn't Ellie discover the real reason why Abby killed Joel, the death of her father, allow Ellie to understand Abby and perhaps empathize with her? So in summary, Abby's segment was an attempt by the writers to make you empathize with Abby in order to make you reconsider Ellie's actions. And yet it comes off as a blatant attempt to make the player sympathize with Abby that actually makes us understand her even less over the course of the segment. A segment whose entire purported purpose to make us empathize with Abby could have been accomplished in about 15 seconds just by showing us the flashback of Abby finding her father dead. And to top it all off, the entire attempt by the writers to get us to empathize with Abby was solely for the player, as Ellie never learns what we know about Abby, which would have resulted in Ellie gaining empathy for her, which may have led to her decision to reconsider her own quest for vengeance. But since they need Ellie to go back after Abby in the third act, they obviously couldn't let this happen. However, I do understand what the writers were trying to set up, to have us reconsider our shared thirst for vengeance by making Abby into more than just a faceless, nameless object of scorn. As I said, they executed this so poorly it isn't even funny, but again, I get it. After we discover that Abby has a rather understandable reason for wanting Joel dead, and after we come to sympathize more with her and a number of people that Ellie kills in her segment, we begin to reconsider how we felt about Ellie's quest for revenge. Instead of seeing Ellie as a heroic avenger who was killing evil baddies, we realize they are all just regular people with understandable motivations who are all caught up in a ruthless cycle of hate, grief, and violence. And here is why that breakdown is complete fucking bullshit. So based on the words of the creators and the views of many of those who have heaped positive praise onto the game, the concept of switching from Ellie to Abby was meant to make you so enraged over Joel's death that you share Ellie's thirst for vengeance. But then when you play as Abby, you begin to reconsider the bloodthirsty tunnel vision you had while playing as Ellie, realizing that while you may be the hero of one story, you are the villain of another. The problem is, this doesn't work on any conceivable level. So the idea is that we as players would be so blinded in our pursuit to avenge Joel that we wouldn't realize the consequences of our actions until we switch to Abby. The problem is that Joel is quite the complicated character. I have seen some praise Joel as the undisputed righteous hero of part one, given that there is a slim chance that even if the Fireflies were able to develop a vaccine, it wouldn't change the fact that distributing it to the masses, even if they were able to do so, would somehow bring the world back to the way it used to be. Throughout the entire game, the story really shows just how terrible and awful the world has become. Not just because of people being killed by and are turning into infected, but the fact that by the end of the game, it is evident that the most horrifying aspect of this new world is the surviving population itself. Murder, rape, and cannibalism are widespread. Civil conflict and government crackdown is the norm. A vaccine probably wouldn't do all that much to rectify a lot of this. By the end of the game, the question isn't will they be able to save the world, it's is the world capable of, or rather worth, being saved. In Joel's eyes, no. Over the last 20 years, Joel has seen and been involved in the absolute lowest lows of human capability and cruelty. While characters like Tess and Henry may still have hope for the human race, Joel sure as shit does not. This is evident by the fact that before Joel and Ellie arrive at the hospital in the final section of the game, Joel tries to urge Ellie to end their quest and return the Jackson. Note that this is before Joel knows that creating a vaccine would result in Ellie's death. For all he knows, creating a vaccine would require nothing more than a pinprick to Ellie's little finger. He just doesn't care. He has seen what the world has become and doesn't believe it can or deserves to be saved. Now as for the other characters, Ellie, Henry, Tess, Marlene, who believe that a vaccine most certainly will lead to a new world, do they realize that the chance of a vaccine really doing all that much is rather slim? Well, maybe, but it doesn't matter. These characters have been dealt with so much trauma, loss, and horror, at this point it's simply about their attempt to find something to fight for. 
to find a light in the darkness. But in any case, the actual viability of a vaccine doesn't really matter. It's not as if Joel, in the short amount of time between him being told about Ellie's impending death and his decision to rescue her, did a statistical analysis regarding the probable practicality of creating a vaccine, he didn't give a fuck. He had already given up on humanity before this moment. The reason I bring this up is that both those who angelify and demonize Joel do so by bringing up things like, would the vaccine work? Would it actually be possible to widely administer such a vaccine? None of that matters since the characters don't make the decisions based on said potential outcomes. Joel decides to save Ellie because he didn't care one way or another if the vaccine worked. He just wanted Ellie. The Fireflies probably didn't think about the long-term practicality of a vaccine in a post-apocalyptic world, or consider that sacrificing the life of a single young girl is not automatically justified because it may lead to producing said vaccine. But given the fact that the Fireflies are made up of numerous people who have been fighting and clawing and struggling for years and years and years, their decision to kill Ellie for what they believe to be the greater good is understandable. Many have argued that the Fireflies are not in the wrong since Ellie would have wanted them to do the surgery. But Marlene and the Fireflies didn't know that. What if Ellie rolled up and after learning that she would need to be killed in order to create the vaccine, she said fuck that shit. Would the Fireflies respect her request or knock her out and go through with the surgery anyway? Again, we have to judge the characters based on what they know at the time of making said decisions, rather than taking into account other information that only we as an audience know or speculations as to what might happen in the future. If one looks at either Joel or the Fireflies as the hero or villain of this situation, then they are cheapening the great lengths the story went to to show that said labels are sometimes only a matter of perspective. The key is that you understand, given the established characterization of both parties, the reasoning for the actions of each. How you feel about Joel, Marlene, and the Fireflies as a whole really wasn't what the story was concerned with. It was simply making you understand why they made the decisions they made. But then again, even if you did see Joel as a straight up hero or villain, or thought he was a more complex and morally debatable character, it doesn't matter. Since no matter your opinion of Joel, the intended purpose of switching from Ellie to Abby on the player doesn't work since that would require you to become invested in Ellie's quest for vengeance. Let's say you see Joel as a villain. Well, then in this case, you are most certainly not on board for Ellie to go on her quest for vengeance. Why would you be for Ellie traveling across the country and entering an extremely volatile war zone to avenge a man who betrayed her? I imagine most who saw Joel as a villain want Ellie to stay in Jackson and not risk her life for a man who did so wrong by her. But well, let's say you see Joel as the undisputed hero of the first game. Well, then you still probably wouldn't have wanted Ellie to go on her quest for vengeance. If you agreed with Joel's decision to save Ellie from the Fireflies, then why on earth would you possibly be down for her to, once again, enter a volatile war zone in order to avenge him? A quest that most likely would result in her death. Even if you are furious at Abby and her group and want them dead, Surely the fact that Ellie going after them is the last thing Joel would want, and if Ellie were to die, it would completely defeat the purpose of Joel's decision to save her at the end of the first game, would make you reconsider. No matter your feelings about Joel and the effect that his death had on you as a player, I can't see any way in which you would think that Ellie going to Seattle is in any way a good idea. We may empathize with Ellie's drive to avenge Joel, but that doesn't mean we sign off on it. That is a very crucial difference. For me personally, I was sad to see Joel die, but it's not as if I was naive enough to not understand it was as a result of his own doing. The horrible things Joel has done over the last 25 years were blatantly telegraphed in part one. It's odd too, because the game treats us discovering the reason why Abby killed Joel as some sort of twist or reveal, even though most people could easily infer the reason she wanted him dead was because he killed someone close to her, given the fact he has killed Lord knows how many people by this point. This makes her line when she asks Joel to guess who she is unintentionally pretty funny, since most players would have probably been like, yeah, you're really gonna have to narrow that down for me. So with that said, the only way in which the idea that the player would revel in Ellie's quest only to reconsider it once switching to Abby works is if the player is so absolutely utterly shit pissed about Joel's death that they are able to stomach through the clear emotional trauma that this quest for revenge is having on Ellie. 
and if that is the case for a particular individual, then I highly doubt playing as Abby for 100 hours, let alone 6 to 8, is going to change their mind. In addition to this, even if the writers somehow overlooked all the factors I have already brought up, and truly thought that the player would be totally down for Ellie's quest for revenge all the way up until you switch to Abby, well, this seems like a weird intention to have, considering the lengths the game goes to, to show the morally questionable nature of Ellie's quest, and the horrific mental turmoil it is inflicting upon her all throughout her segment. I would argue that at literally no point is Ellie's quest for vengeance glorified or put in any sort of positive or justified light. Like in the first game, the violence that Ellie dishes out is hard to watch. It isn't portrayed as badass, like say the carnage featured in the John Wick franchise, or dialed down in say a Call of Duty game where you shoot a dude and he just keels over. The game constantly shoves the bloody, uncomfortably graphic violence right in your face. Side note, while I mentioned the improvements in gameplay at the beginning of this video, I would actually argue the fine tuning of the combat is to the game's detriment when it comes to creating a sense of chaos. While the gameplay in part 1 was criticized as lackluster, many commented on how the clunkiness of the combat not only encouraged a more pacifist approach, but also made each physical encounter feel like a true struggle for survival. In contrast, there were times when playing through part 2 as Ellie that I felt she must have trained with the Green Berets during the last several years to become such a tactical operator. However, part 2 compensates for this with a new gameplay mechanic, which I'm not really sure what to call, but I am sure you all remember After Ellie kills an enemy, another enemy will often call out their name in mourning of their fallen comrade. This is meant to ensure that the player realizes that each person they gun down, whether or not in self-defense, is a living, breathing human being with a story and loved ones of their own. It is meant to impose upon the player the true weight of cutting down even a single foe. This mechanic is also what I will crassly refer to as a hmm idea. Imagine yourself in a pitch meeting for The Last of Us Part 2 when one of the developers stands and says, hey, what if after you gun down an enemy, their comrade calls out their name, thus making sure the player doesn't forget it is a real person they are taking out as opposed to just some nameless NPC. And then you would probably go, hmm, that actually sounds kind of interesting. But then you would think for like 10 seconds about how such an idea would be implemented in practice, and then you'd realize how silly it actually is. For one, while the mechanic may be quite the surprise and quite effective, say the first or second time it happens, upon the third, fourth, fifth, eighth, seventeenth time, it begins to lose its oomph, and leads to the player becoming desensitized to it. Ironic, considering the mechanic seems to be intrinsically designed to do the exact opposite. I feel this would have been far more effective and less redundant had it been restricted to only a few encounters. The mechanic itself seems even more half-baked when you consider that after you've killed all but one enemy in an encounter, the last one standing will sometimes drop to their knees and beg for mercy. On paper, this does seem interesting, but in practice, not so much. Since if you decide to spare the enemy begging for their life, after a few moments, they will just stand up and start shooting at you again, as if nothing happened. I think it would have been far more interesting if you did decide to spare the last one standing, they were to flee. Perhaps once they reach a particular point on the map, said action spawns several more enemies, or perhaps leads to the enemies later on in the section being far more on alert since they know you are coming, thus making the player consider if sparing a particular enemy is worth the consequences. That was just me spitballing away to flesh out the mechanic a little bit, but the fact that they just stand up and start blasting as if nothing happened makes an already overly insistent mechanic feel even more half-baked. So if the developers wanted the player to revel in Ellie's quest for vengeance, why did they add this mechanic which, almost immediately upon her entering Seattle, begins to impose the moral grayness of her decision on the player? Gameplay mechanics aside, at no point is Ellie's quest for revenge glorified or put in any sort of heroic light, particularly by the end of day two, after Ellie tortures Nora to death for information. Instead of this scene in any way being satisfying or cathartic, it is horrifyingly disturbing, with Ellie being framed as an evil demon bathed in red light, mercilessly cutting down a helpless victim. And once again, instead of gaining peace or relief from killing Nora, Ellie's despair is only amplified. It is at this point most players realize 
that even if Ellie does end up hunting down and killing every single person who had a hand in Joel's death, it isn't going to make her feel any better or bring her peace and is most likely only going to lead her to sink deeper into her grief. The overall point I am making is that if the entire point of having the audience play as Abby was to empathize with her, thus making you reconsider the actions you committed as Ellie in her playable segment, well, this doesn't work at all since there is nothing to reconsider. The game already makes the player start to reconsider Ellie's actions upon her first enemy encounter in Seattle, and I would argue at the very least, by the end of day two, most players would have already gotten the message. Well, yeah, but the point of switching to Abby is that you can see the WLF from their side, and so the game can flesh out the characters that Ellie ends up killing during her segment, once again, to make the player reconsider how they initially felt about killing them. Once again, the problem is that I highly doubt meeting any of these characters in Abby's segment after killing them in Ellie's has all that much of an effect. Jordan was trying to strangle Dino when Ellie killed him, so meeting him in Abby's segment doesn't really change how one feels about Ellie killing him earlier. Manny is given a bit more characterization as the game shows him taking care of his elderly father, but Manny's death at the hands of Tommy isn't shown until later in Abby's segment. As for Nora, we do interact with her quite a bit in Abby's segment, and perhaps showing her taking care of the wounded members of the WLF would make you sympathize with her a bit more. But the problem is, is that when you kill Nora in Ellie's segment, it's already framed as some fucked up shit. It's not as if I felt good about beating the dying and helpless Nora to death with a metal pipe in the first place, considering how the scene is framed like a borderline horror film. Seeing her alive in Abby's segment offers no recontextualization. Killing Bear is an option in Ellie's segment, and then you can play fetch with him in Abby's segment. But again, nothing has changed. In my first playthrough, when I sent a shotgun blast into Bear's chest, heard him whimper his last breath, and heard his owner call out for him in mourning, I felt plenty shit in the moment. Having the player play fetch with him as Abby later on doesn't really make the player feel any worse. The Bear example is particularly strange, since you don't have to kill Bear in Ellie's segment and can skip right by the encounter if you are stealthy enough. You don't even have to play fetch with Bear if you don't want to while playing as Abby. But just to make sure the point is driven home, the game forces you to kill Alice as Ellie and then forces you to play fetch with her later as Abby. But again, I don't think playing fetch with Alice is going to make you feel any worse than you already did when Ellie was forced to drive a knife into her neck. Same goes with Mel. Meeting Mel and interacting with her in Abby's segment did give me more empathy for her. But once again, this empathy in no way made me feel any worse than I already did when it was revealed that I just killed a pregnant woman. The only death that has recontextualized all that much is Owen's, since after we learn of just how much Abby cared for him, we understand Abby's rage in going after Ellie after she finds him dead. Although I would argue this would have been far more effective had we not seen them interact in the prologue, which informs us of their romantic interest for one another. Because of this, when Abby shows up to kill Ellie, at the end of Ellie's playable segment, we can already surmise it is primarily because of Owen's death. So with all of that said, I would argue that having us meet all of these characters after their deaths doesn't actually make the player reconsider the morality of killing them in Ellie's segment, since there really wasn't all that much to recontextualize. It was always framed as morally not cool. But also since Ellie kills most of them in, at least to some extent, self-defense, this is cheapened even further. We will discuss that later. As inept as this is, it is even more inept when you consider that part one actually accomplishes exactly what part two was trying to do in a far more subtle and nuanced way. In part one, you may very well go through most of the game feeling as if you are the hero, as you play as Joel transporting Ellie to the Fireflies. Even as you kill scores and scores of people, perhaps you don't really give all that much thought to their deaths, considering they aren't really all that humanized, or maybe, like Joel, you were able to convince yourself it was them or you, and you had no choice but to do it. However, all of that gets turned on its head in a single moment. Those were my friends, you <laughs> this scene takes place right after Joel is injured at the college before the switch to Ellie for the winter segment, a whopping two thirds into the game. This is the first time we have one of our enemies humanized in such a way. It doesn't feel forced or insistive, it merely feels like an extension of the story. When we hear him say Joel killed his friends, we suddenly realize that these nameless NPCs we may have been killing with reckless abandon throughout the game were all living, breathing humans. 
This point is made again a little bit later when David says, He said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. Once again, we are shown how Joel is seen through the eyes of those who oppose us. And thus, the theme is clear. We may be the hero of our story, but we are in fact the villain in the stories of others. This delivers the exact same thematic message that part two tries to hammer down the player's throat, except it does so with a few sparse lines that fit in with the narrative and don't feel like the writers are screaming in your ear. After these bits of dialogue, we as a player are then forced to reconsider all of the people we have killed up until this point, and the weight of their deaths start to creep into your mind. Perhaps you can try to justify the horrific acts you have committed up until this point by saying it was merely about survival and that you didn't have a choice, just like Joel does early in the game. Guess what? We're shitty people, Joel. It's been that way for a long time. No, we are survivors. Which is later subverted when Joel calls out the Fireflies for the exact same we had no choice mentality in the final scene. There is no other choice here. Telling yourself that bullshit. In addition to this, the final scene at the hospital in part one, once again, delivers the exact same thematic beat that part two tries to deliver, but fails to do so. When Joel begins making his way through the hospital cutting down fireflies, I would say many players may not think about the true ramifications of what we are doing. We are put in Joel's shoes and feel the instinctive need to save Ellie as we, like him, have grown to love and care for her over the course of the game. Whether you believe saving Ellie from the Fireflies was justified, or at the very least you got caught up in the heat of the moment, the game then forces you to play as Ellie in the final segment. Here the game is making you look at Joel from an outside perspective, making you reconsider what he did through the eyes of the girl whose life's purpose he took away. Once again, none of this is really shoved in the player's face. It simply feels like a natural extension of the story. And this is exactly what the writers tried and failed to do with the switch from Ellie to Abby in part two. Not only did part one accomplish this, but they did so in a fraction of the time. When the hunter at the college said that Joel killed his friends, you get it. You don't need to see this guy caring for his sickly father. You don't need to play as his character and find out he has a fear of the dark in order to humanize him. Part one makes a point and moves on, trusting the player to understand what it's putting down. Part 2 repeatedly hits you over the head with the same message over and over and over and over again, and it ends up being far less effective because of it. What is quite ironic about Part 2, seeing as the game revolves around empathy, is that it's almost as if the writers for Part 2 had a lack of faith when it came to the capacity for empathy of the player. Like they felt that if we didn't hear these WLF members calling out each other's names, or didn't meet the characters we kill later on under different circumstances, or didn't walk in their shoes for several hours, that we wouldn't be able to sufficiently humanize them, which is extremely condescending and borderline infantilizing, especially considering they didn't take into account they already made this point in part one, and thus it feels like they are just retreading old ground. So with all of that said, would there be a way to structure the story in a way which would all around improve it? Well, there is actually. During my first playthrough, both me and members of my chat mentioned an idea as to how they could have structured the story that would have made it work. And I was surprised to find that this was actually a widely held sentiment held by many, even some of those who praised the game. And that solution would be, instead of having us play through Ellie's segment and then switch to Abby's segment, have the players switch back and forth between Ellie and Abby throughout the game, just like they do in the prologue and epilogue. And just like that, the story would have been improved tenfold. Earlier I spoke of how the pacing of the story is hurt severely by bringing the player to the narrative's highest point at the end of Ellie's segment and then dropping it like an anvil by switching to Abby. If the game had switched back and forth, each character's story would proceed together in a congruent fashion. Now switching back and forth may make the pacing a bit wonky depending on where they decide to put the switches, but I'd argue this is still immensely preferable to the AB style that is implemented. And even if the pacing is a little wonky, this would not be all that big of a deal. Since we are seeing Ellie and Abby's stories unfolding together, 
and thus the tension of the narrative continuously builds as the game progresses. Since we know which characters make it to the end of Day 3 and Ellie's segment, this makes Abby's segment derived of a lot of tension. Since we know Abby is going to make it, we know Abby and Ellie aren't going to cross paths before the end of Day 3, and we know Tommy is going to make it, which in turn leads to the Marina Slamber face-off completely devoid of any and all tension. By switching back and forth, the narrative would constantly be building tension. When we know that Ellie is heading for the hospital while Abby and Lev are on their way as well, for Yara's medical supplies, we wonder if Ellie and Abby are going to run into each other. When Ellie is on her way to the aquarium at the end of day 3, we know that Owen and the pregnant Mel are there, so what is going to happen? Switching back and forth would also allow the game to get its message across in a far less on the nose fashion. One of the biggest gripes most had with the switch from Ellie to Abby was that at the moment we took control of Abby and began playing as her, it was incredibly obvious as to what the writers were trying to do, and thus the point of the switch was accomplished in about the first 5 seconds, and then the player must play through Abby's entire segment that is devoid of a massive amount of tension seeing as we already know how it ends. Switching back and forth would communicate the same idea, but feel a lot less like a bait and switch. And by switching back and forth, the recontextualization of Ellie's actions would occur every single time we switch back to her. We would see the reason as to why Abby wanted to kill Joel, and then see Ellie trying to hunt her down. We would meet and begin to empathize with the characters of Nora, Mel, and Owen before Ellie confronts and kills them, making their deaths hit even harder than they did by themselves in Ellie's segment. Again, by having the development of these characters happen after their deaths, it doesn't have as much of an impact on the player since their deaths were already framed as quite tragic and pointless and or somewhat justified due to them attacking Ellie. The game would get the same message across, every hero is the villain to someone else, but in a far less blatantly transparent way. And if we added in my note about having Abby feel guilt about Jill's death, which in turn leads to her setting off to help Lev and Yara, we would see the stories of these two women unfold simultaneously as they react differently to the same event, with Joel's death sending Ellie down a path of grief and darkness while sending Abby on one of hope and light. I am not saying the game wouldn't need to be tweaked a bit to serve the switching back and forth, nor am I saying that doing so wouldn't come with pacing problems of its own. I am simply saying that, based on my observations and the observations of many who played the game, even those who had an overall positive impression of the story, it seems the narrative would have been vastly improved had they switched back and forth. Some have even mentioned that they would have preferred if we got to play as Abby first before Ellie, or Ellie and Abby's stories were completely separate campaigns, although I am sure each of these options would also have their pros and cons. And I am actually going to go one step further, and say that I actually think switching back and forth was, at one point in development, the way that the developers intended for the story to unfold. We switch between Ellie and Abby in both the prologue and epilogue sections, so that is one piece of supporting evidence. The fact that in the Marina sequence, the game hides the fact that the sniper is Tommy until the end, even though they indicate to the player that it is indeed Tommy in Ellie's segment, is another. But my main piece of evidence is a little lady that goes by the name of Whitney. Go, go. So we first meet Whitney in Ellie's segment as she is making her way into the hospital to confront Nora. Ellie sneaks up behind Whitney and puts a knife to her throat. Whitney then attacks, which prompts Ellie to kill her. Later in Abby's segment, there is an optional dialogue we can have with Whitney during day one. But just in case you missed it, we later meet Whitney again on day two briefly when Abby enters the hospital in a cinematic cutscene. However, I actually have a sneaking suspicion that the developers had originally intended for the player to meet Whitney as Abby before she is killed by Ellie. When Ellie swims up and puts the knife to Whitney's throat, there is a pan around that almost makes it seem as if this is meant to be some sort of reveal. But of course, we have never seen this woman before. I actually think the PS Vita was a nice touch that worked well to humanize Whitney before Ellie kills her. But the game tried to drive this point home by having us meet Whitney later. I suppose to try and make us feel differently about killing her, even though this doesn't really work, since Ellie only killed Whitney after she pulled a knife on her. After meeting Whitney in Abby's segment, I kept thinking that had I met Whitney before Ellie kills her, it would have been far more impactful. Also, when you are sneaking up on Whitney as Ellie, you can hear the sound of Whitney's PS Vita, 
Later in Abby's segment, you can hear it as well. So to me, it seemed like the original concept of this would have been, you first meet Whitney as Abby and hear the PS Vita tune. As Ellie is sneaking up on the WLF soldier in the hospital, whose face is obscured, if you listen closely, you can hear the same music, thus tipping off to observant players that this is in fact the PS Vita chick you met earlier as Abby, which is officially revealed when the camera pans around. Again, I haven't read anything to support this theory, that this was the original way the game was meant to be structured. I am simply going off the little evidence I have and the general feeling by many that the game would have been greatly improved had the game been structured this way. So why did the writers opt for the AB structure as opposed to switching back and forth? I'm honestly not sure. Perhaps they were too married to their conceptual ideas and then think about the other problems it would lead to. Perhaps they tried to do the switching back and forth but had difficulty figuring out when and where to put the switches so they just said fuck it and scrapped the idea altogether. No idea and speculating doesn't seem to be a worthwhile endeavor. But all in all, I would argue it tremendously hurts the pacing, tension, and overall thematic messaging of the game, making the bulk of the game into a structurally and thematically incoherent clusterfuck. Anyway, that is all I really have to say about that, so let's get back to where we left off. So Abby tracks Ellie to the theater and kills Jesse before holding Tommy and Ellie at gunpoint. Ellie flees as Abby shoots Tommy and pursues her. They face off, with Abby gaining the upper hand. Keep in mind, this is the feeling we could have felt in the marina sequence had we not known that Tommy survives until the end of day 3. The tension that was absent from that sequence is here in this one, as we are horrified that we may have to kill Ellie as Abby. Dina intervenes who is then incapacitated when Lev shoots her in the arm with an arrow. Abby ferociously beats Dina and puts a knife to her throat. Ellie pleads Abby to stop, saying that Dina is pregnant. And it is here that we see the culmination of Abby's arc. Abby has allowed her revenge to consume her for years, resulting in her losing what could have been a fulfilling and loving relationship. Her lust for vengeance almost destroyed her, turning her into a killing machine with little to no remorse. And even after she achieved her goal, it gave her no fulfillment and left her with a life in ruins. Even after she decided to help Yara and Lev, despite the magnanimous woman she was able to become, that doesn't change the fact that it was her thirst to find the man who killed the one she loved most that led to all the horrible things that have come to pass. That her friends who stuck with her through thick and thin and even attempted to make her see past her rage and move on are all dead because of her. Perhaps the old Abby would have been so enraged that she would have happily slaughtered those who killed her friends. But now she knows that all that will lead to is more bloodshed. An endless cycle of trauma and mourning, Abby realizes that this has to end with her. And it is here, as she holds the knife to the pregnant Dina's throat, realizing that Mel was right, and it was her own selfishness that led to their current situation. That Owen, Manny, Jordan, Nora, Mel, and her unborn child would all be alive today had she been able to move past her own grief. And this is where Abby decides to let the cycle of vengeance end and... Good. What the fuck? All jokes aside, I want to take a moment to talk about Abby. Following the leaks revealing major plot points of the game and the game's wide release, the character of Abby became, to put it mildly, one of the most controversial video game characters of recent memory with her being the focus of a clusterfuck of online fury and hate. I think we can all agree, or at least I hope we can, that the more extreme vitriol aimed at not necessarily the character, but at the writers and the actress who portrayed her, Laura Bailey, was quite uncalled for and over the top. But I want to take a look at why Abby is such a despised character by many, despite the fact that by the end of the game, she is, on paper, perhaps one of the most heroic and morally righteous characters of the entire series. And I believe this has to do with an egregious lack of respect that she was given by the writers. The character of Abby, as she exists in the narrative, is less of a character than she is a plot device. She was given some personality and characterization, but both were incredibly half-baked. From giving her a fear of heights, which doesn't really come into play thematically, to giving her an arc where she goes from a revenge-fueled killing machine, to literally giving up everything she knows and risking her life multiple times to help Yara and Lev even though, as we discussed, the catalyst for this change didn't really ring all that true, to putting her playable segment after Ellie's to try and get the player to reconsider Ellie's actions, despite the damage this does to both the pacing and tension of the narrative 
as well as the fact that it doesn't really work at all. The point I am getting at is that the writers didn't give Abby the respect she deserved as an individual character. She was shaped and molded by the writers with the intentions of what the writers wanted to do with the story as the most pertinent objective. Because of this, Abby feels more like a thematic device as opposed to a fully realized character. Now one could argue that every character in every story ever is just a device when you break it down. But it's not just about the character as they exist on the page. The animation, the performance, all shape who this individual is, and oftentimes, truly great characters, in a way, take on a life of their own, within a fandom or pop culture as a whole. I would argue that the characters of say Joel and Ellie have done this very thing. They were so brilliantly written and given so much respect by the writers, the performers, and the audience that they transcend their own story. When people look back on The Last of Us, they don't remember the bare thin plot that was just there as an excuse to let the characters shine. They, of course, remember the characters. Just look at the reaction they got when the first trailer for part two was revealed. And that brings us to Abby. Abby's character doesn't really make all that much sense. As I mentioned, her motivation for helping Yara and Lev is seemingly contradicted by her own established characterization. And in the end, after an arc that saw her become a knight in shining armor, the writers, instead of giving her a moment of reflection, penance, and regret, have her about a half second away from slitting the throat of a pregnant woman, but then she looks at Lev and then just decides not to. And then on top of all of that, decides to let Ellie go. Again, even though she killed all of her friends. Abby isn't even a character by this point. Nothing she is doing makes any sense. She is just doing what the writers need her to do in order to drive the stories of other characters and push the thematic message of the narrative. She has a dream about Yara and Lev and decides to go back for them, despite the fact that she once again tortured and killed a man moments after he saved her life because the story needs her to. She forsakes the WLF, who she has been with for the last several years, not because she has come to realize the error of their ways or how their extreme hatred for the Seraphites has turned them into brutal monsters, she does because she has to become a morally righteous person by the end of her segment in order to make the audience feel conflicted when her and Ellie end up facing off. She doesn't decide to spare Ellie and Dina because she realizes and finally comes to accept the fact that her friends are all dead because of her selfish actions, come to think of it, she never seems to have a moment of reflection about this. She just looks at Lev and then just decides not to because the story needed her to. Looking back, I am struggling to connect the dots when it comes to Abby's arc trajectory because it is so thin and underdeveloped. But we know the writers are capable of drawing an incredibly intelligent and powerful arc as they did in Ellie's segment. So why does Abby's arc feel so phoned in? because the writers just didn't give a shit. Because to them, Abby was just a means to an end. Her motivation is weak, she is given shallow characterization, her entire arc is a dime store rehash of the Joel Ellie arc from part one, and she is never given a moment where she realizes the error of her ways and repercussions of her actions. She is nothing more than a plot device. I have mentioned throughout the video several times where it seemed the writers had the characters make strange decisions that were based less on their characterization and more on story necessity. Joel and Tommy allowing themselves to be ambushed, the WLF group leaving Tommy and Ellie alive, Maria allowing Ellie and Dina to go to Seattle, Dina not trying to help Ellie through her grief or convince her to stop her vendetta, Jesse not really giving Ellie a reality check about the repercussions that her actions may result in for the rest of the Jackson settlement. Or perhaps you could argue that these were momentary lapses that need to occur to allow the story to unfold as it does. I mean, I wouldn't, and will hold the writer's feet to the fire for playing the story over characterization, but maybe some of you can. But I can't see how you can do this with Abby. I have seen numerous people try and connect the dots of Abby's arc, but they always end up being incredibly vague. Playing the well maybe game, seeing things and making connections that aren't there, to try and explain her arc trajectory, perhaps feeling that there must be something else deeper going on. But the truth is, there isn't. Abby is barely a character. She is simply a device, a means to an end. The writers wanted us to empathize with Abby, so they say, 
but it seems as though Abby's entire segment was just about trying to force the player to sympathize with her, to see her as a borderline superhero who would selflessly sacrifice herself numerous times without any semblance of personal gain. The writers want us to be conflicted when Ellie and Abby face off, but they didn't trust that the audience would warm up to Abby if she was just written as a complex and layered individual, so they made her Wonder Woman. And then I guess to try to balance the scale and give her a bit of moral grayness, they have her all gung-ho to slit the throat of a pregnant woman. This whiplash moment doesn't make us see Abby as a complex individual, it makes her seem like a borderline sociopath. They could have had Abby have a moment of reflection as she realizes what she has let her revenge turn her into. Perhaps her realization that Dina is pregnant, making her realize that Mel's death is on her hands. But no, she is ready to do it and then just stops when she sees Lev. This then makes her decision to let Ellie go even more baffling. Abby now has Lev to look out for. Abby, you already let Ellie go once and she came back and, as far as you know at this point, killed both Owen and the pregnant Mel in cold blood. Why would you let her go? It's not even about revenge, simply about ensuring Lev's safety. There is no moment where it seems like Abby realizes the futility of the cycle of revenge and that she needs to stop it. She just decides to. And as I said in the prologue section, Abby's decision to let Ellie live, which could have been an incredible moment, if Abby was given a character beat where she realized her own complicity in the deaths of those she cared about, and knows this is the only way to bring it to an end, well, it would have been soured anyway, since Abby already let Ellie live in the prologue after she killed Joel. Why? Abby was characterized as a hate-fueled killing machine. Why would she decide to spare Ellie and Tommy in the prologue? Yeah, but they didn't kill her father. Well, she had no problem justifying the killing of Seraphite children later in the game, so it seems like there is a disconnect here. There is no discernible arc here. Maybe you can clobber something together to try and explain all of this, but it seems like Abby's segment, which was meant to have us empathize with her as a character, by its conclusion, only leads to her being a far more confusing and underdeveloped character. But once again, the writers didn't really care. Abby is a story device. She wasn't given the respect she deserved as an individual. Looking back on part one, it is amazing just how much respect and care the writers gave to each and every single character. Their motivations and drives were clear, and their actions all made complete sense given their circumstances. Even if it meant that we didn't agree with the morality of their decisions, or hell, even if it meant we didn't necessarily like the characters by the end of the game, each of the characters was given respect. They were fully fleshed out individuals who were allowed to create the narrative through their wants and needs, rather than just serving whatever purpose the writers needed them to in order to push their story forward. And the place they hold in the minds of gamers all over the world proves it. But sadly, this is not the case with Abby. Abby could have been given the respect she deserved and developed as her own individual character, outside of the needs of the narrative. Perhaps we as players may not have liked Abby, a woman who has allowed her grief to consume her for years of her life. Perhaps she would have been difficult, perhaps she would have been borderline detestable, but for the love of God, we could have respected and understood her as a character, as an individual, as a fully fleshed out human being. Just as we did when Joel perhaps doomed the fate of humanity in order to save the little girl he has grown so fond of. Just as we did when we heard Marlene's devastating audio recording in part one, showing the horrific ordeals she has been through that led her to be willing to take the life of the daughter of her close friend. Just as we did with Ellie as we saw her devolve into a selfish and morally sunken individual in order to quell the grief of losing the one person she had left in the entire world. But instead, Abby was not shown any semblance of said respect. And thus, let me extend my sincerest condolences. I am truly sorry, Abby. You deserve better. Anyway, let's get back to it. The story picks up several months later with Ellie, Dina, and baby JJ enjoying a peaceful life on a farm on the outskirts of Jackson. A lovely sequence that is a refreshing change of pace given the bleak and dour tone of the game up until this point. But despite the peace that Ellie has seemingly found with Dina and JJ, via a ferociously unsettling PTSD flashback of Joel's death, we, unfortunately, are shown the harsh truth of Ellie's trauma. It may slowly start to get easier to deal with, but it will sadly never go away. 
Sometime later, Ellie returns from a hunt to greet Tommy, who bafflingly survived a bullet through the eye and trekked back to Jackson. Tommy, who is now seemingly drunk on vengeance, gives Ellie information regarding the whereabouts of Abby and Lev. But thankfully, it seems that Ellie has, though somewhat reluctantly, put her desire for retribution behind her, much to the chagrin of Tommy. That night, we are shown what we believe at the time to be Ellie's final interaction with Joel. At a dance for the Jacksonites, Ellie and Dina share a dance and later a kiss. Our favorite bigot sandwich artist, Seth, calls Ellie a dyke. Ellie is just about to do to him what she did to David when Joel steps in. Joel asks Ellie if she's okay, to which she responds by chastigating him, telling him she doesn't need him. Ellie then decides to continue her quest to kill Abby. Dina begs her not to go, seemingly giving her a final ultimatum, but Ellie makes a decision to go after Abby. Meanwhile in Santa Barbara, Abby and Lev attempt to make contact with the remnants of the Fireflies, but are ambushed by a group of slave traders known as the Rattlers. Sometime later, Ellie picks up Abby's trail and arrives in Santa Barbara. Ellie is kidnapped by a pair of Rattlers, but is able to gain the upper hand and discovers where Abby and Lev are being held captive. Ellie battles her way through the Rattlers' compound and ends up setting a number of their victims free. As all hell breaks loose as the prisoners revolt against the Rattlers, Ellie, despite her injuries and fatigue, makes her way to the beach to finally confront Abby once and for all. And let's stop there and backtrack. As I said, the sequence with Ellie, Dina, and JJ is a breath of fresh air, and as I am sure many of you can relate to, after seeing Ellie go through literal hell for the majority of the game, it was relieving to see her finally reach a point where it seemed she was able to attain a sense of contentment and solace in her life. Her PTSD flashback was well done, and I think it was an important and vital aspect of her character's journey, as it shows that getting over trauma is not a one-time sort of thing, but rather a gradual process of healing and acceptance. At first, I thought it would have been far more effective if these PTSD attacks were peppered throughout Ellie's time in Seattle. But in retrospect, I think saving it for a one-off made it more impactful. But then there is the scene where Tommy visits Ellie and Dina. And I'm going to try my best to get through this without raging, but we'll see how that goes. So Tommy arrives and is all gung-ho about getting revenge on Abby. So much so that he basically roasts Ellie when she decides to put it to bed. So let's talk about the many, many problems in such a short scene. In the prologue segment of this video, I spoke about how whether or not Tommy had the same burning desire for revenge as Ellie did right after Joel was killed wasn't apparent. In the scene where Tommy and Ellie converse after Joel's death, Tommy seems to try and convince Ellie to put the issue to bed and to not do anything rash. He seems far less enraged and impatient as Ellie. This could be for a number of reasons. Perhaps Tommy is older and understands that Joel's death is as a result of the world they live in, especially considering all the horrible things he and Tommy did following the outbreak. Perhaps Tommy, while of course in mourning over the death of his brother, understands that, while he is in pain, he has others in the community he is responsible for. Or as I mentioned earlier, perhaps Tommy knows that a retaliation against the WLF may lead to them coming back and wiping out the entire settlement. But no matter the reason, it seemed apparent that Tommy did not have a comparable borderline death wish-esque revenge drive as Ellie did, who it was made clear would stop at absolutely nothing, no matter the cost or danger, to deliver retribution unto those who killed Joel. Now while this may seem like splitting hairs, it is actually incredibly vital in understanding and establishing Tommy's motivation throughout the majority of the game. When Maria tells Ellie and Dina that Tommy fled for Seattle and instructed Maria to keep Ellie locked up until he could put an end to it, Based on his demeanor in the previous scene, it seemed that his primary motivation in seeking out those who killed Joel was not to satiate his own thirst for revenge, but to prevent Ellie from going on a warpath and most likely getting herself killed. This makes sense given the opening of the game where Joel tells Tommy what happened in Salt Lake City. Tommy knows just how much his brother loved Ellie and the immense consequences that saving her resulted in. So perhaps Tommy knew that the one way he could honor the memory of his older brother was to do whatever it took to ensure the person he loved most in this world was kept safe. This is even further supported by the fact that we are shown that Tommy grew to care for Ellie over the years as a surrogate niece, and how later in the game, after Tommy meets up with Ellie in Seattle, when it comes time to head back to Jackson without killing Abby, he doesn't seem all that salty about it. Unlike Ellie, who still seems to be reeling over the fact that Abby is still breathing, even after all she has done so far in Seattle. 
Tommy seems to prioritize the safety of Ellie, Dina, and Jesse over killing Abby. The overall point I am making is that Tommy's primary motivation throughout the game, up until this point, has seemingly been to ensure that Ellie doesn't go rogue and get herself killed. While he is obviously broken up about Joel's death, his grief doesn't manifest itself in the same way as Ellie's does, which only makes Tommy's radical disposition change in the epilogue of the game that much more of a whiplash character turn. When Tommy speaks with Ellie, he is borderline frenzied in his desire for Ellie to hunt Abby down, to the point where he guilt trips and castigates her when she refuses to do so, which is an insanely sharp contrast to his disposition throughout literally the entire game up until this point. Now let me give a bit of charitability and say that the game does seem to try and hint at what the cause of such a radical disposition change could be. When Tommy arrives, he mentions that he and Maria have separated. Well, maybe upon returning to Jackson, Tommy and Maria had a falling out, which led to Tommy becoming embittered, which in turn led to him channeling said bitterness into attaining vengeance against Abby. Okay, that seems somewhat reasonable. Seems odd that it happens completely off screen and there was barely any indication that Tommy and Maria were on the outs and there is no indication as to what led to their falling out. Maybe Tommy leaving for Seattle or Maria allowing Ellie to go after him. Maybe the fact that Tommy is no longer able to enjoy 3D movies also factors in. As you can see, I am employing the trusty well maybe form of argumentation, but let's just put that aspect of this scene to bed and just accept that Tommy has allowed his grief to turn him into a far darker character. But what I find to be completely and utterly inexcusable is the fact that Tommy wants Ellie to be the one to go after Abby. So let's recap what we just went over in regard to Tommy's arc. The opening of the game features Tommy learning from Joel that he ostensibly doomed the entire human race to the effects of the Cordyceps infection in order to save Ellie. Tommy clearly knows the pain Joel suffered after losing Sarah and is extremely sympathetic to this, as evident in part one, when he saw Joel and Ellie interacting in Jackson, which led him to agree to take Ellie to the Fireflies, so as not to allow his brother to suffer that same pain once again. His main motivation throughout the game is to keep Ellie safe by way of asking Maria to keep her in Jackson while he takes care of the WLF group that killed Joel. Again, I am not saying that he didn't necessarily have a desire for vengeance, but as I laid out, it seems like his primary motivation is to keep Ellie from being killed, which in turn makes him wanting her to go after Abby completely and utterly baffling. Even if we buy Tommy's disposition change from him seeming rather level-headed about attaining vengeance to becoming borderline consumed by it, why on earth would he want Ellie to be the one to go after Abby? His entire motivation up until this point was keeping her safe either or both because of his own love for her and because he knows it is the one thing that Joel would want. Ellie already tried to take out Abby and it resulted in her face being rearranged. And the only reason she is still alive is because Abby decided to spare her. So what exactly is Tommy thinking here? He wants vengeance for Joel so bad that he wants Ellie to go after Abby, which is literally the exact opposite of what he knows Joel would want him to do. He wishes to honor his dead brother by guilt tripping the person his brother loved most in this world into going on a mission she most likely won't walk away from. Keep in mind by at this point, Ellie believes Joel was killed by Abby due to his actions in Salt Lake City. And thus Tommy must then know that Joel was killed due to the actions he carried out in order to save Ellie. And thus, Tommy wanting Ellie to go after Abby makes no sense, since if Ellie ends up being killed, which is quite probable given how her first attempt to take out Abby went, then Joel literally would have died for nothing. In order for us to believe Tommy's disposition change, we would have to assume that over the last several months, Tommy has become so blinded by raging vengeance, something that we see no indication of beforehand, that he would be willing to allow Ellie to die hunting down the person who killed Joel, even though he knows for a fact it is literally the last thing that Joel would want him to do and would result in his death meaning absolutely nothing. I've heard people try to defend this turn by saying it goes along with the larger themes of the story, namely how revenge can lead to you becoming a truly selfish person, wallowing in your own misery and grief. But once again, we see the writers becoming more redundant by the second. We already got this theme expressed several times over the last 12 or so hours of the game. I am not saying this is a bad plot beat due to me basically thinking it destroys Tommy's entire character. I suppose I could see a scenario where Tommy does become a man consumed with grief, but the writers didn't earn this. 
It all happens completely off screen and we are given basically no information as to what caused it outside of Tommy and Maria splitting up. But even then, it's an extremely thin line to draw. Having a character do a complete 180, a turn that is not shown or demonstrated or supported, and having it hand waved by some because it fits in with the already redundant thematic messaging the game has been hammering down your throat for the last several hours is something I find to be absolutely astonishing. And it becomes even worse when you realize that the entire reason the writers had Tommy undergo such a radical change is due to plot necessity. Because if Tommy doesn't become drunk on revenge, then he never tracks down Abby, which means he never gives Ellie her whereabouts and thus Ellie wouldn't be able to go after her in the finale of the game. And thus, once again, we see characters becoming story devices. The writers put the story they wanted to tell and the themes they wanted to explore over staying true to the characters. They didn't respect them, they were merely a means to an end. So after the writers murder Tommy's character, that night Ellie has a flashback of, again, what we presume at the time to be, her final words to Joel. As I stated before when discussing Ellie's arc, this was done incredibly well and finally resulted in the purpose of the structure of the flashbacks falling into place. We finally see the reason as to why Ellie has been so adamant about hunting down Joel's killers. She is left with the immeasurable guilt of knowing that her last words to him were of malice and hatred and that he died without her being able to make amends. Again, how one could possibly be able to process and reconcile such a traumatizing experience is beyond me, which in turn makes her futile descent into vengeful madness completely understandable. It is then that Ellie decides to go after Abby again. It isn't even made clear if Ellie believes that killing Abby will finally give her peace or put an end to her lingering trauma. She simply must go after Abby as her grief has completely encapsulated her being. That is all she lives for now. As I said, the scene between Dina and Ellie as Ellie prepares to leave is absolutely phenomenal, as we finally see Dina putting her foot down. As I mentioned earlier, I found this scene to be quite reminiscent of the cabin scene in part one. Ellie shows her true selfishness when she says she is not like Dina. Unable to realize Dina is in just as much pain as she is, but realizes her pain does not give her carte blanche to disregard those that depend on her. Again, I would have liked this conflict between Dean and Ellie to have been built up a bit more throughout their time in Seattle, but this scene is so damn good, it is merely a slight nitpick of a complaint. We finally see Ellie's most selfish act, leaving the woman she loves and the home and family they have built, not because she was forced to, but because she chooses to. At this moment, Ellie sees her greatest fear come true. She is all alone. Moving on, the sequence in Santa Barbara before Ellie and Abby's final standoff is a bit of an uneven mess. We see another new faction introduced incredibly late into the game, which is even more disappointing when you consider the other factions we have been introduced to so far, the WLF and the Seraphites, were rather undeveloped. Now you could say that the Rattlers are just a bunch of sadistic slave traders, so there really isn't all that much to flesh out, but therein lies the bigger problem. Up until this point, the game has been making the player reflect on the morality of their actions by way of humanizing certain characters and or groups. But for the final showdown, it seems the creators didn't want the player to worry about that, so they introduced the Rattlers, who are presented as straight up evil and sadistic, and thus killing them doesn't really instill the same intended effect on the player as the killings earlier in the game did. Consider the framing of when Ellie kills Nora versus when she kills Guy Fieri over here. In the case of Nora's death, it is framed as Ellie devolving deeper into a questionable morality, whereas when she kills Frosted Tips, it's just whatever. Also, and this is a small strange point, but the writers seem to put emphasis on the fact that this dude's final plea to Ellie is identical to Joel's final line of the first game. Was this intentional? Were the writers trying to say something by doing this? Was it just totally coincidental and I am reading too much into it? I honestly don't know, and by this point I am too exhausted to speculate. Ellie's final push into the Rattler's compound is quite the set piece, given both the sheer size of the Rattler force and the add mechanic of being able to release restrain infected and sick them on hostiles. But again, it seems to fly in the face of the intended purpose of literally everything that came before it. I suppose it was meant to be a quasi parallel to Joel's final rampage through the hospital in the first game, but the thematic context could not be more of the polar opposite. In the first game, Joel killing the fireflies in order to save Ellie is meant to be the most morally questionable sequence of the game, whereas Ellie's final rampage through the Rattler compound is part two Ellie's least morally questionable sequence. 
Again, going back to my contention about the game being far better than the sum of its parts, this sequence is actually quite excellent, but it just doesn't fit in with what the rest of the game is trying to do. This is even further muddied when the same last hostile begging for their life mechanic is used in the Rattler sequence. In this case, it works even more poorly than it did early in the game since the Rattlers are framed as absolute sadistic psychos. Side note, I have seen some argue that the conflict between the game's smooth and refined gameplay and the thematic messaging is meant to be an exploration of ludonarrative dissonance, basically when the gameplay clashes with the narrative in some way. Perhaps the reason the game promotes things like weapon upgrades to make Ellie a more efficient killing machine while simultaneously shoving the questionable morality of said killing in the player's face is meant to be a deconstruction of said dissonance. As writer Walt Williams of Spec Ops The Line said, in regard to Luo narrative dissonance, it gives the opportunity to frame the protagonist as a hypocrite. Now you could say the developers were trying to do this with Ellie. However, I would argue this contention doesn't work for a number of reasons, mostly in relation to how the game treats Ellie as a character, which I will delve into in just a little bit, but also due to the fact that, while it may be that the developers meant to call attention to this dissonance in Ellie's playable segment, I would argue this is contradicted by Abby's actions in her segment being framed in a far more positive and heroic light, and the fact that any sense of said dissonance is scratched in the final segment. The Rattlers are not shown to be complex or victims of circumstance, but rather just straight out sadistic evil motherfuckers. So as Ellie cuts her way through them, the deconstruction of Luo narrative dissonance doesn't apply, since the game doesn't make you feel reluctant to kill the Rattlers. Ellie is killing straight up sadists at this point, whose actions cannot possibly be rationalized or moralized. I would argue that people who argue the game attempted to deconstruct Luo narrative dissonance are ignoring the incredibly uneven way the game goes about doing so, and perhaps may even be trying to mask the fact that in reality, the developers didn't have a single cohesive vision for the game. Anyway, Ellie makes her way through the Rattler compound and frees a group of prisoners who then lead a rebellion against their captors as Ellie makes her way to the beach to confront Abby. Which brings us to the final segment of this video, which is entitled, Earlier I heaped praise upon the writers for their courage in making Ellie quite the unsympathetic character. Since Ellie is such a charming and insanely likable character in the first game, I was afraid that the writers would shy away from making Ellie a morally questionable protagonist, a la Joel Miller, and simply make her a righteous avenger who does no wrong. I was pleasantly surprised when I saw that the writers made Ellie surprisingly unsympathetic during the course of the game, and challenged us to empathize with her plight even as we saw her devolve into a truly broken individual. But unfortunately, the goodwill I extended to the writers during Ellie's playable segment I must now rescind, as by the end of the game, it was clear to me that the writers went to great lengths to quote unquote protect Ellie if you will, and that there was a certain level of self-consciousness present in the narrative that seemed to be as a result of the writers being worried about making Ellie into too much of a morally gray character. This self-consciousness of the writers manifests itself not only by putting Ellie in situations where she is basically shielded from moral debauchery, but also by changing her characterization ever so slightly in order to satiate the needs of the story they wanted to tell. For some odd reason, the writers, I, I don't want to say dumbed down, but seemed to slightly retcon Ellie in regard to how keen she was as to what happened that day at the hospital in Salt Lake City. Well, maybe. I'm actually not sure. L let me explain. In the finale of part one, after Joel and Ellie return to Jackson, after Joel lies to Ellie about the viability of her immunity, Ellie seems to low-key confront Joel about what happened at the hospital. Now while it is not explicitly stated or expressed, I would argue that it seems rather clear that Ellie is to some extent aware that Joel is clearly lying to her about the fireflies. She doesn't know exactly what went down, but she knows Joel is clearly hiding something from her, which is why she confronts him and makes him swear to her that he is telling the truth. I feel like if Ellie did feel as if Joel was being 100% truthful, that she wouldn't have confronted him as she did on the outskirts of Jackson. And this makes sense given her character. Ellie is a sharp kid. She wakes up in a car in a hospital gown and Joel gives her some thrown together explanation as to why. She obviously knows something is up. I would argue that the general interpretation of the ending that most players had 
was that Ellie knows Joe is BSing her to some extent. But given Ellie's fear of being alone, she knows that if she continues to push him and admits to herself that she knows he is lying, that she may not be able to forgive him. And thus, she puts it to bed. Perhaps you may have a different reading of the scene, but I'd strongly argue that myself and most players saw this as Ellie basically knowing Joe was not telling the truth, but deciding to put it to bed in order not to lose him. And it seems like Neil Druckmann seemed to have the same reading of the scene. Then we come to that ending and that lie and that okay, and what does that okay mean? It's definitely not a complacent, yeah, I'll go along with you. In fact, it's the opposite. It's Ellie waking up for the first time, waking up and realizing she can't rely on him anymore. While she loves him for what he's done for her, she hates him for robbing her of that choice. Now, I am not saying that we must take Druckmann's interpretation as gospel, but this did seem to be the interpretation that many walked away with following the ending of the game. That Ellie knows to some extent that Joe is lying to her, and while she may put the issue to bed at the moment, over time, it may start to erode their relationship. And this is what seemed to be happening in the first flashback in part two. Ellie and Joel's lovely outing to the museum is soured when they come across the dead firefly. It seemed as if this was a moment where the fragile concession that Ellie made that day to go along with Joel's lie was beginning to wear thin and that soon Ellie would no longer be able to allow her love for Joel to supersede the fact that his decision that day nullified the sacrifice of so many Ellie cared for. But then came the second flashback, where Ellie and Joel find the couple who fled Jackson and were bitten, and things began to get a bit confusing. So after Ellie realizes that the two dead they come across are the couple that fled Jackson a year previous, Ellie seems to make what at least I presume to be initially as a slight jab at Joel, saying if only they were immune. She then begins, again what at least I thought she was doing at the time, to lean on Joel about the flimsiness of his explanation as to what happened that day at the hospital. So given both these lines, it seems as if Ellie is beginning to call Joel out on the fact that she knows he is clearly lying and that she cannot keep acting as if she believes him. But then after Joel reaffirms his lie that her immunity basically meant nothing and it wouldn't have done a damn bit of good, Ellie then seems to desperately ask him why he didn't let them see if there was another option. So with this line, it seems as if Ellie does believe Joel's story about her immunity being unviable. And then in the third and final flashback, after Ellie goes to the hospital and learns the truth about what Joel did and why he did it, it seems as if Ellie is completely and utterly blindsided, making it seem as if she has believed Joel this entire time and is only just now coming to realize that he betrayed her. Or maybe not? I honestly wasn't able to gauge it all that well almost as if even the writers weren't sure by this point. I've seen streamers and journalists mention that they loved the reveal of the player realizing that Ellie knew the truth about what happened at the hospital. But was this supposed to be a reveal? Again, yes, she learned the exact specifics, but I was always under the impression that she knew Joel was lying. It just seems like her reaction at the hospital was a bit strange. Now, while at first glance, this may seem as if I am splitting hairs over a rather unimportant detail, whether or not Ellie knows Joel was lying at the end of the first game completely changes not only the dynamic between Ellie and Joel, but also how much of a sympathetic character Ellie is come part two. If Ellie is completely bamboozled by Joel at the end of the first game and completely believes what he tells her about what happened at the hospital, then that means their relationship from then on out is rather intact. Her feelings towards him are not affected at all since she doesn't know that he betrayed her, and it is only after she discovers the truth at the hospital that their relationship is destroyed. However, if Ellie knows, at least to some extent, that Joel is lying at the end of the first game, then their relationship from then on out is built on an already fragile foundation. She knows that he is lying to her, and yet decides to accept his lie in order to salvage their relationship. I would argue this makes their relationship a far more dynamic and interesting one. One where, in a way, Ellie is far more in control of its fate. Ellie is the one who is deciding to keep the charade up. Whether or not Joel knows that she knows the truth is irrelevant. Ellie knows Joel is lying, and she knows that all she has to do is keep asking questions, and his falsehood will unravel along with their relationship. Again, it may seem rather innocuous, but it completely changes the level of agency that Ellie has in their dynamic. In the former, with Ellie believing Joel, she is merely a victim, a young girl who has been betrayed by the one she loves most, who disavows him the moment she discovers the truth. In the latter, 
I would argue Ellie is given a much higher level of agency. She is the one in control. It is her that is defining the relationship. As long as she is able to keep the facade going, their love for one another can be maintained. But as time goes on, the guilt of knowing that she may be in some way complicit in preventing a vaccine from being developed by going along with Joe's lie eats away at her and results in her becoming embittered and perhaps feeling guilty. So again, while it may seem innocuous, whether or not Ellie believes Joel's lie completely changes the dynamic of their relationship, and I would argue the level of agency that Ellie is given by the writers, and because of this, it also changes how much of a sympathetic character Ellie is in part 2. So let's say that Ellie completely believes Joel's lie at the end of the game. This means that for the past 5 years in Jackson, she has simply been dealing with her own grief over the fact that she was not able to give meaning to the deaths of those she cared about by helping create the vaccine. Once she discovers the truth and that Joel had been lying to her, she is completely betrayed and breaks it off with Joel immediately. Basically, she is framed as, again, far more of a victim. But now let's say that Ellie did know to some extent that Joel was lying about what happened at the hospital. That would mean that Ellie decided to go along with Joel's charade in order to preserve their relationship as opposed to going back after the fireflies to discover what really happened to her in the hospital. And thus, that means for the last four years, Ellie has, to some extent, been lying to the other members of the Jackson community. What if there are people in her community who she has grown to care for who lost people to the chorus of infection after they returned to Jackson? Would Ellie then feel guilty that she may be knowingly going along with Joel's lie, which may have prevented a vaccine from being developed? If Ellie did believe Joel's story was suspect and her most pertinent goal was to still create a vaccine, wouldn't Ellie turn her ass around as soon as they got to Jackson and try to find the fireflies? Again, it's a small detail that completely changes Ellie's characterization. In one scenario, she is simply the victim of a monstrous lie. In the second, she knowingly goes along with that lie regardless of the fact that doing so may result in more people dying from the cordyceps infection in order to keep her relationship with Joel intact, which could be seen as albeit understandable given the trauma of losing so many loved ones and her primary fear of ending up alone, but somewhat self-serving. As I said, I would argue that the latter would have been a vastly more interesting dynamic to play around with in part 2, and it was in fact this dynamic that I thought the writers were setting up from the very first flashback. But then it seemed like the writers went with the former scenario, by having Ellie being completely clueless as to the fact that Joel was lying. Maybe? Again, I don't think this was made all that clear, particularly due to Ellie's dialogue in the second flashback. Maybe the writers did intend to portray Ellie as knowing that Joel has been lying to her this entire time, but I would argue they do a pretty piss poor job of making it clear one way or the other. And I would also argue her portrayal in part 2 leans toward her being more in the dark. Aside from this, it seems like the fact that Ellie, since she went along with Joel's lie, is to some extent also complicit and responsible for the deaths of everyone who has succumbed to the infection is never really addressed. She gets uber pissed at Joel at the hospital after she discovers what really happened. But it just seems odd that this was the moment she completely decided to forsake him since she has known he has been lying this whole time. It also sort of makes her complete disgust and hatred at Joel seem unwarranted and makes her kind of seem like a hypocrite since she has been knowingly keeping up this facade for years. The point I am getting at is that even if Ellie knew Joel was lying this whole time and it took her finally confirming the truth to finally tell him to go fuck himself, why don't the writers have her reflect on the fact that she is also culpable here? She knew he was lying about something. She could have turned around as soon as they got back to Jackson and went after the fireflies. Also consider that the writers make sure to mention that after Jerry's death, hope for a vaccine was pretty much null. So even if Ellie did go back, it wouldn't have changed anything. So already we see the writers slowly stretching the credibility and believability of their world in order to serve their own needs. I found the idea that Jerry was the only person who could develop a vaccine to be borderline ridiculous. Why? No other surgeon the Fireflies could have possibly found could have made a vaccine? This is given no qualifier or greater explanation, and only means to serve a single purpose, to put the entire concept of a vaccine to bed. Had Ellie not heard this little tidbit, then she most likely would have hauled ass to find the Fireflies so they could still make a vaccine, as she would have believed there was still a chance to create one, but that would have gotten in the way of the story they wanted to tell, so they had to nip it in the bud. 
I don't know, but to me it seems like at the very least, the Ryers attempted to do all they could to keep Ellie's hands totally clean here. I think at the very least, the Ryers wanted to sort of ignore the fact that at the conclusion of the first game, Ellie's decision to go along with Joe's lie, rather than her going back to the Fireflies, also sort of makes her culpable in preventing a vaccine from being developed. They are perhaps worried that by having Ellie going along with Joe's lie, she too could be held complicit in the deaths of every single person who died as a result of the infection from then on out. After she discovers the truth, she can't even do anything to rectify it since, as she learns from the tape recorder, even if she were to track down the fireflies, or even if she did turn around immediately upon them arriving at Jackson all those years ago, due to the death of Jerry Anderson, there would be no way to develop a vaccine. And thus, it's all Joe's fault and Ellie going along with his lie didn't matter one way or the other. This is honestly the strangest aspect of the entire game to me. The fact that the writers didn't seem to really commit to either Ellie being completely duped by Joel or being super keen to the fact that he was lying, which is why this whole section of this video is all over the place. But I would argue that at the very least, the writers did their best to try and dispel the idea that Ellie could possibly be culpable in preventing a vaccine from being developed and put it all on Joel's shoulders. But why? Well, because it seems that the writers wanted to prevent Ellie from becoming too much of a morally ambiguous character in order to give her a semi-redemptive ending. But wait, you may say, how can she be given a somewhat redemptive ending when she killed so many people in cold blood? Well, she didn't. I mean, that depends on if you count the NPCs that may be killed during gameplay, but we'll get to them in a moment. But if we just go by the canon kills, if you will, that Ellie performs throughout the narrative, well, they are all... I don't know if justify is the right word, but basically framed in the best possible light to keep Ellie from becoming too unsympathetic and irredeemable. Ellie kills Jordan, but only because he was at the time trying to kill Dina. She kills Whitney only after Whitney pulls a knife on her. She kills Owen and Dina only after the former tries to wrestle her gun from her and the latter pulls a knife on her. So all of these could be seen to be somewhat justifiable, or at the very least, framed in the most justifiable way they could possibly be. Even the quote unquote worst thing that Ellie does in the game, torturing Nora to death, is structured in a way that protects Ellie as much as possible. Nora runs from Ellie and is later infected by the Coriceps infection, after Ellie and her fall into the basement after being confronted by WLF troops. It is only after Nora is about to succumb from the effects of the infection that Ellie tortures her. I am in no way saying this act is justified, but again, it seems like the writers tried to frame it in a way that keeps Ellie's hands as clean as possible. Since Nora was basically a goner in the moment anyway, it isn't as if Ellie is killing her in cold blood. It just seemed odd that in a game where we see the protagonist allow her grief to send her on a morally murky warpath, that we don't really see Ellie do anything that could be said to be completely and utterly irredeemable. And again, I would argue that this is because the writers wanted to protect Ellie as much as possible. This is why they don't say, have Ellie kill the pregnant Mel in cold blood. Sure, Ellie kills her, but only after Mel attacked her with a knife and Ellie didn't know she was pregnant, so, I mean, we can sort of give her a pass for this one, right? Never mind the fact that in order to make this scene play out as it does, neither Owen nor Mel mentions the fact that Mel is pregnant, which logically is a bit weird. Hey, do you think we should tell her that you're pregnant? Ah, uh, that seems kind of like a cheap move, don't you think? I think the reason the writers did this was because, since the ending has Ellie deciding to spare Abby, it would be kind of nullified if Ellie deciding to spare her was treated as a redemptive moment of her coming to her senses if she had mercilessly killed Jordan or Whitney or Nora or Owen or Mel earlier. This also makes the whole aspect of meeting these characters later in Abby's segment even more pointless. As I mentioned before, I did feel a bit more sad about Owen's death in Ellie's segment after I got to know him a bit more in Abby's segment. But since Owen tried to wrestle the gun away from Ellie, in retrospect, it sort of was his own fault in a way, so meeting him later on in Abby's segment didn't really make me feel as differently as I could have. But then there is the fact that even though the player may be able to be extremely charitable to Ellie in the situations in which she kills characters in these scripted sequences, what about the fact that, depending on how the player plays the game, Ellie could have, by this point, killed upwards of a hundred unlucky souls who get in her way. If you were like me, who sucks ass at stealth, I guess you could frame all the kills that Ellie commits in her playable segment 
as self-defense, but this doesn't stop the player from just going on a psychotic rampage, killing everyone that gets in their way without a second thought. And now this brings us back to the ludonarrative dissonance argument. Now on one hand, I may be able to argue that all of the kills that Ellie commits while the player is controlling her shouldn't count and should not be considered canon, since the player can just as easily sneak past all of them. Again, this may simply be an issue with the medium of video games in general. However, as I mentioned before, since the game draws significant attention to the fact that the people Ellie kills are living, breathing humans, and not just nameless NPCs, this is where things get a bit confusing. It's sort of odd to have Ellie's big redemptive moment at the end of the game being her sparing Abby, when it is totally possible that the player has killed upwards of 100 people over the course of the game as Ellie. If the player either snuck by all the enemies or took them out John Wick style, should that then have an effect on how we see Ellie as a moral character? I don't know, and honestly, I don't think the developers did either. Should they have implemented an honor system of some sort, a la Red Dead Redemption 2? Rockstar implemented this as a way to have the actions of the player, not necessarily the character of Arthur Morgan, influence the story. Perhaps Naughty Dog could have had different endings based on how the player plays the game? I don't know how well this would have worked, but I would argue it shows the developers didn't really take into account the different ways the player may interact with the game. This is once again an example of their ideas being more of a jumbled bag of random thoughts rather than them all working together to create a coherent and purposeful experience. It should be noted that this little narrative dissonance does not exist in the first game. While the player may either kill as many people as possible as Joel or try to avoid conflict as much as possible, it is completely irrelevant because the game is not trying to maintain Joel's moral purity. By the time we pick up with Joel 20 years after the outbreak, Joel has done so much awful immoral shit it's not as if the player doing their best to pacifist the game is going to make us feel any different about him. The story is not one of redemption. This is what I was talking about earlier about how not being worried about keeping your character morally pure can actually be quite liberating. We don't need to like Joel, we simply need to understand him in order to become invested in his story. You could easily see Joel as a selfish bastard by the game's end, but you can also fully understand why he does what he does. He isn't a hero, he's a human. Joel may even be a perfect example of how ludonarrative dissonance can be used to enhance the game as opposed to detracting from it, in the way that William spoke of earlier by portraying Joel as a bit of a hypocrite. Throughout the game, though you could argue that Joel killing all of the people that stay in his way is immoral and bad, you could possibly frame it as necessary not only for his and Ellie's survival, but also, since they are on their way to make a vaccine, for the greater good, and that all of the bloodshed is worth the ultimate end goal. Except this is thrown out the window when Joel does the exact opposite of seeking the greater good at the end of the game. Joel literally says fuck the human race and saves Ellie. And just to make sure the point is driven home, at the end of part 1, the game forces you to kill the surgeon. There is no reason why, if he wanted to, Joel couldn't easily incapacitate the surgeon without killing him. But at this moment the game is taking the option away from you. This isn't the player killing the surgeon, it's Joel. This is the game telling you that this is the man that Joel is and that this is what he's going to do despite how the player feels about it. A lot of discussion can be had about the actual morality of Joel's final decision, but the point is that Joel didn't give a shit about whether or not he was morally justified in his decision. He just wanted to save Ellie. The moral ambiguity created by the killings committed by the player is used to enhance the thematic elements of the game, whereas in part 2, they don't really work. If the game gives you the option to literally kill every single person who stands in your path, thus not really caring all that much about Ellie being framed as a morally good person, then why did they always give her the easy way out? Why did they seem to downplay her culpability in preventing the vaccine from being developed? Why did they always give her a sort of olive branch when it came to the cinematic kills she commits? Now some of you may be thinking that my entire gripe with how the game treats Ellie is based on the assertion that the game is trying to keep her as a morally pure character. But what if the developers don't give a shit about whether or not Ellie is kept as a totally sympathetic character or any sort of morality at all? Well, I would argue this is contested by the way the game comes to an end. So after Ellie frees the prisoners at the Rattler compound, Ellie makes her way to the beach and finds both Abby and Lev on the pillars. Ellie cuts Abby down and follows her and Lev as they make their way to the boats. Instead of having a change of heart after seeing Abby in such a weak state and her saving Lev, Ellie instead goads her into a fight which feels like an incredibly out of place final face off 
just for the sake of a dramatic set piece. Ellie gets the upper hand and proceeds to drown Abby, coming right to the point where she is about to finish her off, but then Ellie seems to recall a memory of Joel alive, which leads her to spare Abby. So let's talk about this. I understand what the writers were trying to say with this scene, that this was the moment that Ellie realizes that killing Abby isn't going to accomplish anything and isn't worth sacrificing her soul for. Having Ellie kill Abby wouldn't really make all that much sense in terms of the narrative. However, the problem here is that having Ellie not kill Abby also doesn't make all that much narrative sense either. I agree with many people who have praised the ending when they mention that Ellie sparing Abby is sort of the point of the game, that Ellie needed to realize that her quest for vengeance isn't going to dispel her grief and turmoil. The problem is that Ellie's decision to spare Abby is completely and utterly arbitrary. Let me give a counterexample so you can see what I'm talking about. In part one, the finale is marked by two major decisions made by our main characters. Joel deciding to rob humanity of a cure by saving Ellie in the hospital, and Ellie's decision to go along with Joel's lie at the end of the game. Now picture we are back at the beginning of the game where Joel and Ellie begin their journey to Salt Lake City. And let's say instead of them traveling for almost a year together, they found some teleportation machine and just magically appeared at the hospital. Would Joel and Ellie then make the same decisions they make in the game? Of course they wouldn't, because the reason Joel and Ellie made their respective decisions at the end of the game was the emotional bond they formed for one another. Joel caring for Ellie resulted in his decision to forsake humanity to save her, and Ellie caring for Joel resulted in her going along with his lie. The ending is completely dependent on the journey that the characters took to get there. Their decisions were as a result of how they changed during said journey. But this does not apply to the ending of part two. Ask yourself a question. Why does Ellie decide to spare Abby? Was it because of anything that we see happen to her throughout the game? Well, no, not really. I mean, she did go through an immense amount of trauma in Seattle, but she ends up going back after Abby anyway months later. Was it because Ellie, like the player, realizes that Abby is actually a good person? Well, no, since Ellie never learns what we learn about Abby. Her view of Abby as a person doesn't change one iota over the course of the game. Was it because Abby spared her in Seattle? Again, no, because then why would Ellie decide to hunt her down a second time? Was it because she saw Abby save and take care of Lev, reminding her of how Joel cared for her? Well, no, since Ellie puts a knife to Lev's throat to goad Abby into a fight. The answer as to why Ellie decides to spare Abby at this exact moment is because the writers wanted her to. Because they wanted to give Ellie a semi-redemptive ending. Because they wanted to keep her from doing something so horrible that it would result in the player losing any and all sympathy for the character, seeing as how far they went to get us to sympathize and like Abby and see her as a beacon of heroism. There is no real reason why Ella decides to spare Abby or why she has a sudden change of heart. She just does. Yeah, but we saw the vision of Joel which made her stop. Okay, but why now? Why at this exact moment? Why didn't Ellie have this memory of Joel on the way to Seattle? Or after she found out that Dina was pregnant? Or while she was beating Nora to death with a lead pipe? Or after she returned to Jackson? Nothing that happens during Ellie's journey seems to lead to any sort of change in her that results in her deciding to spare Abby. She just doesn't go through with it. I am glad Ellie decided to spare Abby as I knew it wouldn't give her any peace. But I kind of wish she had come to this sudden epiphany earlier. You know, before she went to Seattle which resulted in the deaths of Jordan, Nora, Owen, Mel, Mel's unborn child, and Jesse. And this begs a far more pressing question. Sure I am glad that Ellie didn't go through with killing Abby, but did the writers make her make this decision in order to keep her from becoming too much of a morally repugnant character? I would argue it seems like it, but this seems odd considering, as we discussed, how much carnage she could have potentially caused depending on how the player plays the game. How can this be a redemptive moment for Ellie when she may have canonically murdered dozens of people by this point. But then again, maybe the game didn't want you to consider any kills that Ellie commits in gameplay as canon, which is why up until this point, all of her cinematic kills were framed in a far more justifiable light, or at the very least, were framed in a way where she was to some extent protected as much as possible. If it sounds like I am starting to become incoherent and that I am completely at a loss for what the hell the contentions and intentions of the story actually are, well yeah. I feel like the game doesn't even know what the hell it's saying, or is even trying to say, by the end of the game. It's like every time it seems like they're trying to do something, or make a point, there is something that contradicts or nullifies it. But it doesn't feel like this is being done purposefully. In part one, 
The blatant hypocrisy of Joel's, I am not a bad person, I am a survivor, and or there is no other choice and I was forced to mentality is the entire point. No one in part one is really framed as a good or bad guy. They are all just portrayed as desperate people trying to make their way through a seemingly hopeless existence. And any semblance of morality is simply something they use to justify their own horrific actions. By the end of the game, no one is framed as in the right. The writers simply ask you to understand these people based on their worldview and their circumstances. To put it concisely, <laughs> well, part one felt as if the developers were just presenting you a story with characters who were not classified as good or bad, and the player is given freedom to make up their mind on how they feel about them. Whereas part two, primarily due to the structural choices, feels as if it is trying to insist you feel a certain way about certain characters at certain times, which not only fails due to the incredibly transparent way they go about doing so, and the fact that doing so results in the consistency of many characters getting thrown out the window, but also because in doing so, the game seems to try and establish some sense of a moral baseline, which thus results in the viewer applying this baseline to the whole game, which in turn leads to it becoming an absolute clusterfuck of what in Lord's name are you trying to say here. Again, it feels like the writers had a bunch of ideas, but didn't sit down and think about how they would, or rather would not, work together, which in turn results in the narrative becoming a jumbled mess of a dozen conflicting half-baked conceptual ideas. But here's the kicker. Even if you feel that everything in the game was done in a very purposeful way, in order to be purposefully confounding, in order to prompt discussion about morality and whatnot, and it was simply about watching these characters grappling with a nihilistic existence, well then why did the writers have such casual disregard for established characterization? Berea, Dina, Jesse, Owen, Mel, Tommy, Abby, Joel, Ellie, all characters who at some point during the narrative make ridiculously illogical or out of character or insanely arbitrary decisions in order to serve the story. And just for some of you who may be considering arguing the whole humans aren't logical defense I have heard dozens of times, by illogical I don't mean they didn't make the most optimal decision they could have made in a possible situation, I am saying they make decisions that don't make any sense based on what is presented in the narrative itself. Why didn't Owen or Mel mention Mel's pregnancy when Ellie pulled a gun on them? Because humans aren't logical? But what does that even mean? Why does Maria allow Ellie and Dina to go after Tommy? because Maria is illogical, but why? Characters acting illogically or in a non-optimal way only works if there is an established reason for them doing so. It would perhaps be logical for Joel to allow Ellie to die so a vaccine may be made for the Cordyceps infection, but he doesn't. But he doesn't just do it because the story needs him to. The story tells us exactly why he makes this decision based on his thorough characterization. It would be logical for Ellie to call Joel out on his BS story at the end of part one and go back to try and find the fireflies, but she doesn't. But again, not just because the writers want her to, but because it makes sense given the trauma of the loss she has endured and her fear of losing Joel. Otherwise, it is just to serve the story. Otherwise, you have to just accept the fact that certain characters do insanely stupid things for no discernible reason to the point where it becomes so blatantly noticeable that it begins to chip away at the suspension of disbelief. I can't just hand wave massive out of character moments completely arbitrary decisions, and insanely rapid disposition changes as humans are complex, dude. It's just shit writing. But even if you can look past the completely nonsensical and immeasurably thematically incoherent story, it becomes even more confounding when you realize that none of what we saw preceding the ending had anything to do with the ending. Nothing that Ellie experiences before this moment throughout the game explains or seems to support her decision to spare Abby. She just does because she recalled a memory at the exact moment the writers wanted her to, thus making the incredibly nihilistic and pointless journey, and thus the game itself, feel even more pointless. And yet, things get even worse. After sparing Abby, the game cuts to some time later with Ellie returning to the farmhouse. Now at first, it is a bit difficult to ascertain what exactly is going on. Ellie enters the house to find it completely abandoned, save a single room filled with all of her possessions, including Joel's guitar. So perhaps Ellie has come to the farmhouse right from Santa Barbara to find Dina and JJ gone, and her fear of being alone has finally come to fruition? Well, no, since if you look carefully, you can see that Ellie is wearing the bracelet that Dina gave her earlier in the narrative, which she was not wearing when she left to hunt down Abby. 
So it seems to imply that Ellie has already returned to Jackson and patched things up with Dina before coming to the farmhouse to finally make peace with losing Joel. Well, this gives the game a somewhat hopeful and semi-optimistic ending, right? It does, but herein lies a gaping problem. In the end, Ellie, despite everything she has done up until this point, despite the acts she ended up carrying out due to letting her grief take hold of her, despite Jesse being killed because he decided to follow her to Seattle, despite the fact that she left the woman she loves and the infant JJ, faces absolutely zero consequences for literally anything. And here we come to the horrifying apotheosis of the writer's attempt to protect Ellie. They were so coy about making her into a morally gray character and perhaps giving her a bleak ending where she is left with nothing following her path of vengeance that they structured the story in a way in which she faces no repercussions for anything she does during her entire journey. Yeah, but Ellie didn't kill Abby. She had the chance to, but decided to spare her. Well, so what? Ellie deciding to spare Abby doesn't change the fact that her desire for revenge put the people she loves most in harm's way, resulted in one of her best friends being killed, and led her to abandon the woman she loves and the family they had made. Let's say that Ellie did kill Abby. Well, what would be different? Wouldn't she just return to Jackson, patch things up with Dina, and everything would be exactly the same? Why would killing Abby change any of this? Well, you may say, if Ellie had killed Abby, it would have made her into a completely irredeemable character, and she wouldn't have been able to return home and rekindle her relationship with Dina. Why? Again, if Ellie had killed Abby, would Dina then not take her back? And the idea that not killing Abby makes Ellie any less of a morally degenerate character by this point is rather silly, considering the fact that, despite the writers doing their best to try and shield Ellie from becoming a morally corrupt individual by basically giving her outs in most of the sticky situations she finds herself in, and even if you don't count all the people she may have killed along the way while being controlled by the player, and even if you can get over the fact that she tortured Nora to death with a lead pipe, she has arguably done worse shit already in her pursuit of Abby, and she probably wouldn't have faced any consequences had she decided to kill Abby, so what was the big deal of letting her go? Ellie's lowest point was the moment she walked out on the one person she had left in this world. I almost feel it would have been more fitting had the game ended right after Ellie leaves Dina, or perhaps once Ellie tracks Abby down, she is already dead, thus making Ellie's decision to leave Dina completely pointless, and she has lost Dina forever. In either case, we would see Ellie facing consequences for her decisions. As much as I would love for Ellie to have a wonderful life of happiness and joy, she did a lot of fucked up and selfish shit throughout the narrative, and the fact that the story basically wipes the slate clean by the end to give her a somewhat optimistic ending seems incredibly disingenuous, and once again makes the entire affair seem even more pointless. Again, I am glad Ellie didn't kill Abby, but said decision, as arbitrary as it is, is stripped of any and all thematic or consequential weight. What would have been different had Ellie killed Abby? Again, I guess you could say she would have never been able to return to Dina and Jackson had she done so, which doesn't make any sense, and there is nothing supporting this, and if Dina was willing to forgive Abby for walking out on her in the first place, why would she draw the line at Ellie killing Abby, a woman she doesn't know and who beat the shit out of her and almost killed her and her unborn child? There would be no consequences. Contrast this with Joel and Ellie's final respective decisions at the end of part one. Joel's decision to save Ellie and Ellie's decision to go along with Joel's story resulted in not only the consequences of robbing the human race of a vaccine for the cordyceps infection, but also the very possible and probable fact that the foundation of trust between Joel and Ellie has been completely and irreparably destroyed. That even though their love for each other was so strong that they both made decisions that will surely mean the death for hundreds if not thousands of innocent people from that moment on, their relationship will never ever be the same. That is consequence. That is an instance where the weight of the decisions made by the characters is fully realized and felt by the player. In part two, there is no such weight. Had Ellie killed Abby, she most likely could have returned to Jackson and gone back with Dina anyway. So anything and everything that Ellie does or does not do throughout the game literally has no outcome on her ultimate fate. And yet, it gets even worse. Ellie enters the room with all of her belongings in it and sits down with Joel's guitar. We are then treated to a scene between her and Joel that presumably takes place the night before Joel's death. 
a few hours after their confrontation in the barn. Ellie confronts Joel about what he did that day in the hospital, but Joel reaffirms that he would make the same decision again if given the choice. Though Ellie says she is unable at the present moment to forgive Joel for what he has done, she pledges that she will try, to which Joel responds that he would like that. It is a lovely and tender scene between these two beloved characters that is completely pointless and actually severely undercuts Ellie's entire motivation throughout the entire game as well as her final decision to spare Abby. As I mentioned before, it seemed apparent to me as the narrative went on that the writers were trying to communicate that the reason Ellie decided to go on a borderline suicide mission to avenge Joel was because of her lack of reconciliation with him before his death. This was seemingly confirmed when we are shown what we at least thought at the time was Ellie's last interaction with Joel, where she castigates him and says she doesn't need him. This is right before she decides to go back after Abby a second time. So again, to reiterate my original point, it seemed as if Ellie's drive to attain vengeance was as a result of the immeasurable grief and guilt she felt about having her last words to Joel be ones of malice. Except that wasn't Ellie and Joel's final interaction before his death. This scene between Ellie and Joel that takes place after their confrontation actually gives some hint at reconciliation between the two. Sure they didn't make up completely, but their final conversation was far more reconciliatory than what we were led to believe. Ellie's near death wish drive to avenge Joel makes sense if you take into account her final words to him were ones of malice, but her drive is significantly dulled once we realize she was, at least to some extent, on the path of forgiving him. It's also odd considering that Joel reaffirms the fact that he would do what he did again if given the chance. So Ellie knows the last thing Joel would want is for her to put herself in danger. So she decides to honor his memory by doing that very thing? Now you could say that Ellie's drive still makes sense since she is driven by her anger at not being able to begin her journey to try and forgive him. But then that makes the scene rather redundant and unnecessary. If Ellie and Joel's final interaction was telling him off in the barn, I would argue it would be far more powerful and allow the player to empathize with her anger and bitterness, more so than with their true final interaction. But regardless, what is even the purpose of including the scene between Ellie and Joel where she claims she will try and forgive him? I understand that this memory was the reason that the writers intended for Ellie to make her decision to spare Abby, but as I said, this is completely arbitrary. Why did Ellie recall this memory at this exact moment and not, oh I don't know, literally any other moment before she was literally seconds away from drowning Abby to death? It's not as if Ellie grew the ability to try and forgive over the course of the story, since we see that she has this capability even before the main event of the story begin. So once again, we are seeing things become even muddier and more confusing. When I first saw this scene, I almost thought it was a dream scenario. Perhaps a visual representation of Ellie trying to reconcile Jill's death within her own mind. But as far as I am concerned, this scene is totally real. I honestly think this scene was just an attempt by the writers to give some closure to the characters and for the player, since the thought of Ellie's final words to Joel being something so nasty would be a hard pill to swallow. But then again, wasn't this the whole point? Isn't the whole main message of the story about learning to see past your grief and find a way to move on and find peace, despite the lack of reconciliation? This final scene between Joel and Ellie does offer a bit of peace and closure for the player, but it actually undermines the entire point of the entire story. Like with the numerous decisions made by the writers to try and protect Ellie, if you will, this seems like the writers pulling their punches, which is strange considering just how many reviewers hyped up the game as being incredibly soul-crushing. There was plenty of bleakness and fucked up shit in the game, but when it came to the really hard decisions, namely making Ellie a completely irredeemable character, making her suffer irreparable consequences as a result of her decisions, or making Ellie and Joel's final interaction one of malice and bitterness, they totally wussed out. Sort of a side note, but in regard to just how much the game was hyped up as a completely soul-crushing experience, I actually found the narrative to be quite desensitizing as it continued. The game was such a ridiculously bleak and hopeless affair that it stops being effective and you just sort of get used to it. It seemed like the writers forgot what made part one such a harrowing experience. In part one, we continuously saw the characters try to find some hope, some light in the darkness, something to keep fighting for but over and over again, it was stripped away from them. It was the glimmer of hope that made the realization of their reality that much more soul-crushing and powerful. 
Despite all the horrifying shit that we experience in part two, nothing hit me as hard as learning the fate of Say, the community formed by Ish, who tried to give others hope in their apocalyptic world by forming a new sense of home, only to have said glimmer of hope ripped away. It was in fact the writer's hesitance to really commit to the themes of loss and bitterness and grief in these instances that undermines the entire narrative. And yet, it gets worse. What I would consider to be the biggest gripe I had with the game, beating out the horrendous structural decisions, the narrative and thematic confusion, a single line that makes up what I consider to be a complete and utter betrayal of the character of Ellie. In the final interaction between Ellie and Joel, as Ellie is calling out Joel for his decision to save her at the Firefly Hospital, thus preventing a vaccine from being developed, Ellie says this. I'm not trying to. I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have fucking mattered. Who the fuck is this person? In the conclusion of part one, when Ellie confronts Joel about what truly happened at the Firefly Hospital, who does she bring up? Does she bring up herself? Her own life? Does she complain it is now her own life that has no purpose? Of course not, because it was never about her own life. It was never about giving her own life a sense of purpose. It was about giving the lives of Riley, Tess, and Sam purpose. Ellie didn't give a shit about giving her own life purpose, which is why we all know she would have been totally down to sacrifice her own life. It was about giving purpose to everyone who died as a result of the infection. This is what made Ellie such a universally loved character, her selflessness, her desire to put the needs of others in front of her own. That is why she needed to make it to Salt Lake City. That is why she fought tooth and nail to get to the Fireflies. For Riley, for Tess, for Sam. But no, in part two, it's about her. It's about her life and her purpose. Except this flies directly in the face of who she was drawn to be in part one. Ellie does become a selfish person by the end of part two, but as a result of what she believes she needs to do to do right by Joel. But in this case, she's just selfish, even before Joel's death. She is throwing Joel saving her from the fireflies in his face and she doesn't bring up Riley or Sam or Tess. I ask again, who the fuck is this person? And it's even worse when you consider her anger at Joel doesn't even make all that much sense. Ellie is angry at Joel for saving her since her life could have meant something. Except if Joel hadn't saved Ellie, then she never would have known she succeeded in her goal and thus she would have died not knowing her life meant anything. And to go back to my earlier point, why isn't Ellie bringing up the fact that she is also complicit here? She decided to go along with Joel's lie. She knew he wasn't being truthful. Why did she never reflect on the fact that if she is going to hold animosity towards Joel for the decision he made that day, and the lie he told, that she is also complicit due to the fact that she went along with the lie, even though she knew it was most likely bullshit. It is such a small point, but is so vital given how contradictory it seems to her entire character's foundation in part one. It feels like this line was written by someone who didn't even understand Ellie or what drove her to travel across the country all those years ago. A complete and utter betrayal of the character, to say the absolute least. When The Last of Us Part 2 was originally announced, I was skeptical, as I felt Part 1 ended on such a perfect note, but I had faith that the same people who made what I consider to be one of the finest narratives I have ever had the good fortune to experience in any medium wouldn't let the brilliant characters they created down. Even after the leaks came out, and I began to become even more skeptical of how the developers could do this well, I was still optimistic. For those of you who watch my stream of Part 2, you can literally see my spirits rise as I play through Ellie's segment, trying to grab on to some glimmer of hope that they may actually be able to pull it off. And then you can see the realization slowly sink in that, just no. As much as I would love to give the game an overall mixed review due to the moments of brilliance found in the game, I can't. Because I cannot judge a game based on the sum of its parts, but must do so on how these parts all work together. As high as the highs were in part two, they are spoiled by just how low the lows were. But the biggest mistake the developers of Part 2 made was putting their characters second. If you read up on the development of Part 1, you will find many instances of the developers stating that the entire experience was constructed around the relationship between Joel and Ellie, and goddammit does it show. 
Everything served their relationship, and it is no surprise that this is what created such an incredible narrative experience. And yet if you look at a lot of comments surrounding the development of Last of Us Part 2, you will find a lot of talk centered not on the characters, but on the themes and concepts the writers wanted to explore. I seldom found all that much discussion about why this narrative needed to be told or why we need to continue the story of these characters. As much as I was excited to see them again, in the end, they felt as though they were simply cogs in a machine, variables in an experiment. And God damn it, does it show. They were not put first. They were not given the respect and admiration they deserve. They were changed and molded on the whims of the writers to serve the purpose of the story they wanted to tell and the themes they wanted to explore. If you take one thing from this video or this channel as a whole, let it be this. For all of you aspiring writers out there who may be struggling to find your voice or stories to tell, one of the biggest cheat codes you can utilize is to create truly incredible characters. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be flawless or invulnerable. They just need to be given the respect they deserve as individuals. You do that, you create fully realized characters, and I promise you they will practically write your story for you. You won't have to think up things to throw at your character to make them struggle because you already know what exactly makes them tick. You don't have to think about what the characters might do in a certain situation because if you have realized them enough, it will be obvious. Part 1 is a brilliant, heartbreaking story of loss, purpose, and hope. But above all else, it is the story of Ellie, and Joel, and Tommy, and Tess, and Bill, and Sam, and Henry, and Maria, and David, and Marlene. Part 2 is, I'm not even sure. The characters are there, but it feels like the writers simply used them to explore the themes and concept they wanted, regardless of how many times, like square pegs into round holes, they had to forcibly hammer them into a tale they didn't belong in, as opposed to letting the characters create the story themselves. And that is the biggest shame of all. Mm -hmm.